Hello everyone and welcome to the Smoodon Making Things with Milo live presentation on casting silicone. My name is Milo and I'm your host today. Um, and I'm also one of the material specialists here at Smoodon. Now today I am joined by Jason and Alex who will be handling the controls and monitoring our chat for the event. Now speaking of the chat, please feel free to use the chat option to ask any questions on today's topics or the molds or castings that you will see here. Now, we'll try our best to get to all your questions. However, if we don't answer your particular question, please feel free to go to our uh, description uh, down below this video. There will be a link where you can submit a tech ticket to one of our uh, customer support uh, agents, and we will answer that uh, personally to you. You can also attach pictures there, so we can get a better understanding of your project. So, what we'll be learning today, we're going to be learning about casting silicone. And we're going to specifically talk about why casting silicone is harder than casting of resin. We're going to talk about the applications that you can see here, requiring uh, silicone rubber, so what is silicone usually used for. We're going to talk about how to choose the appropriate silicone for your project. We're also going to talk about material choices for the casting of silicone, or rather say the molding material choices uh, for casting of silicone. And we're going to show you how to fix mistakes and uh, how to also make repairs and also paint the silicone to finish your project. Now, there is some materials that we'll be uh, covering today here. You're going to see me use the AlgaSafe Alginate to make a mold of my hand, we're going to be using the Ecoflex 0035. We're going to use the Dragon Skin 10NV, as well as Ecoflex 0045 Near Clear, which is a new product. Also going to be using the Moldstar 20T, Sort of Clear 18, Compact 45, Psycho Paint, Silicone Pigments called Silk Pig, and Silpoxy. Those are going to be the materials that we're going to be physically handling here today. Now, let's talk a little bit about why casting silicone is harder than casting resin. The first thing that comes to my mind is the compatibility of the materials. So one thing that you guys should know about silicones is that they can be easily inhibited by a number of different materials that are readily used in uh, everyday applications. But you have to know what these inhibitors are so that you don't make the mistake of combining the two products that don't get well uh, along together and then having a cure inhibition. Now, what are some of the known inhibitors for silicones? Go ahead, you guys can shout at the screen, let me know, but I won't hear it. So I'm gonna let you know. So some of the known inhibitors are latex, uh, sulfur, a big one, uh, urethane rubber is another one, and also some paints uh, will have materials in them, solvents, that can upset the cure of silicones. So you want to be aware of your working area, your uh, model that you're handling, the gloves that you're working with, the tools that you're using, to know what these are made out of so that you don't end up with a cure inhibition uh, when you go to make your mold. Now, what are uh, molds, some of the molds that are used for casting silicone? Usually you will find that these will be rigid molds. And uh, one thing about rigid molds that you may know is that they're a lot harder to make. Uh, they're usually made out of several parts uh, because they don't bend and flex. So you have to make multiple parts to make one single mold that you can then cast into. Now that automatically adds more work to the overall structure. That means you're going to have a lot more seams to clean up. And those seams can be a lot more difficult to clean up. You can't just sand them away and they're gone. You have to cut them away and then what we call seam the area to fix the cut so that it's not noticeable on the final piece. Now another thing to consider when using molds, rigid molds, is the viscosity of the material that's going into the mold and how well that uh, material will flow. 
Uh, for you out there that don't know what viscosity is, it's basically the fluidity, how fluid a product is. And we rate that uh, by um, CPS, that's the uh, measuring uh, that is used for viscosity. And it can range anywhere from uh, 30 CPS, which I believe is the room temperature water. So uh, that would be 30 CPS. And you know how liquid water is at room temperature very liquid. So when you have materials that have a viscosity of 20, 30, 40,000 CPS, you can understand how thick those are going to be and how difficult it is going to be to pour material like that into a mold. So really important to understand uh, how the molds are going to be working for a specific project, a material that you're going to be casting into. The next thing is the fact that if you do need to use a uh, flexible mold, a silicone mold, um, you need to use release agents, right? So otherwise the silicone will bond to itself if it's the same silicone chemistry. So if we apply platinum to platinum with no release agent, they will want to bond. And same thing with the tins. If you add tin on top of uh, tin, they're going to want to bond. Of course, if you add uh, platinum into a tin-based mold, that's just not going to set up because they inhibit each other. The uh, tin in the mold rubber will inhibit the cure of platinum silicone. Again, something really important that you should know before starting a project. Now, the one thing that can save you a lot of trouble, headaches, uh, with this question of compatibility is a small-scale test. You'll hear us talk about small-scale tests a lot, and uh, it's something that will give you a uh, concrete answer. It will give you a straight answer if certain material, materials work with each other or not. Actually, we have a, a quick question, Milo. Yeah, go um, ahead. Someone is asking about using nitrile gloves. Are those okay to use when you're using platinum silicone? Uh, so the question is uh, nitrile gloves. Are they okay to use? Um, in my experience, uh, I've used nitrile gloves with no issues. Uh, I am uh, pretty sure. So nitrile gloves, actually these here are vinyl gloves. So we use vinyl gloves mostly. I'm pretty sure that uh, nitrile gloves can inhibit the cure of certain silicones. So it's a good question. Um, your answer will lie in that small-scale test. Uh, if you're not 100% sure, do a small-scale test. That will give you a concrete answer if even your gloves will inhibit the cure of the product. So one thing uh, that we know for sure, there's latex in certain products like gloves, and we know that latex will uh, cause a cure inhibition. So we usually recommend vinyl gloves. It's the safest uh, product that we use here and never had an issue with those. So we would recommend you vinyl gloves over nitrile. Sometimes the nitrile gloves are also coated with all kinds of powders. Uh, so those as well can in include something in them that could offset the balance of the chemistry of the silicone. So a small scale test will always give you a good answer as far as which materials work with each other and which not. And um, I'll give you a ex good example about that. When I first started mold making uh, in the foundry, um, a new mold maker came in and he did 20 cup tests across the board with the material that we were using for molding. And I approached him and I said, what are you doing? And he said, I'm testing the material in small scale so I understand how it operates, how it functions with the clays, with the tools that I'm using, with the gloves that I'm using, so that he's not surprised when the material doesn't work. So that taught me a lot right there. And uh, to show you guys what a small scale test would look like, I'm actually going to perform one for you just quickly. I have some materials here that I use in my everyday mold making uh, in the shop. Uh, we have a 3D print here. We have a block of clay. This is oil-based clay, I know for sure. And we have a block of uh, tooling board that's uh, urethane-based um, tooling board. And there's different uh, densities of these and uh, different compositions. So you have to be very careful when working with these to understand if it's going to offset the material that you're using or not. So we're going to set up a small-scale test here. 
I'll put some paper down. These are my models that I will be testing my products on. I'll just put this aside real quick. And I'm going to try to give you guys a lot of uh, examples that I've encountered as well over the years uh, working with these materials. So one thing I've learned um, doing small scale tests is that whenever you do a small scale test, you should use the material, the rubber that you're testing should be the same rubber that you're gonna use for that mold, uh, for that project. Don't use another product that you feel like it's a faster setup time and I don't have enough time to wait for this to cure. You're gonna expose yourself to other issues that you might not have foreseen. Um, again, I speak from a little bit of experience because I've been there. Uh, we all make mistakes and I've made those mistakes. The other thing is when you have something like the tooling board that, uh, that we're going to do a, a small scale test on. So the tooling board like this uh, might have uh, materials inside that it will release once you start cutting into it. So again, experience. I've used one of these tooling boards, cut into it, a design, made a mold of it, and then discovered that everywhere I cut into the tooling board, I had a cure inhibition. So it means whenever I cut freshly into the tooling board, it exposed the uh, uh, products inside to the silicone, and the silicone, wherever it touched that tooling board where it was uh, worked on, it did not set up. So negative experience there, but I learned a lot from it. Um, and again, the, the best thing you can do is do small scale tests, learn from it or learn from your mistakes so you don't have to repeat them again. And uh, the small scale test can be a lot cheaper to do than if you waste a lot of material uh, on a larger mold. So today we're going to be using the uh, Ecoflex 0035 to do a small scale test. This is a double zero shore scale. Let's switch this around. Let's see you guys see A and B. Um, this is a double zero shore scale soft silicone. This is translucent. It has a one-to-one -one mix ratio by volume, so I don't need a gram scale. I can simply dispense it and mix it. Uh, this material does set up fast. Really important that you guys pay attention to the working times of the materials so that you don't end up with material that's setting up in your uh, cup without being poured over your model. So one-to-one -one mix ratio by volume. I'm just going to dispense a small quantity here need a lot. More part A and then the part B. And one thing you guys might notice, this silicone pours quite easily, quite nicely. That means the viscosity of this product is quite low. I believe this product is somewhere in the two to three thousand CPS viscosity. Got a mixing cup. And because I know the working time of this material is really fast, I am going to work thoroughly and fast to make sure that I combine the two components together well and don't have the working time expire and have the material set up. And we're going to mix them together, scrape the sides, scrape the bottom of your mixing container. If there's a groove in the bottom of the mixing container, like there is here, make sure you get into that groove, that there is no unmixed material left. And scrape the sides, scrape the bottom of the mixing container to make sure you incorporate those two components well together. Now, I'm going to put this aside. I have my three models here, and I'm just going to put a small amount of material on these where it's not important. Um, I know that I use all these materials in my shop, in my workspace, to make my patterns, so I'm, a, I'm expecting to use all three of these 
with the same silicone, so I'm going to test all of them for the compatibility between the materials. Again, you can just put some on there and then allow that to, to cure. Let the working time expire and see how that is going to react. If it has a, uh, a normal reaction, it's just going to set up and going to solidify, and we can just be able to peel it off. If you have tackiness on the other side of the silicone, that means there is a cure inhibition happening, and there's something on that surface that's not allowing the silicone to cure. A good uh, thing to do is retain your mixing cups. If you have material that you mix, retain that cup, put it aside, don't throw it out. This will be a good indicator if you did a good mix of the materials. So this material, once it sets up, if it does set up, then you have a clear indicator you did everything right by combining the two components together and that your issue, if you're having a problem, is with the um, pattern, is with the materials that you're using in that specific mold. So something uh, to keep in mind whenever you're mixing products to keep that retainer cup uh, so that you can always check back into it. Is there any questions you guys have as far as the small scale test that you guys just saw, what it does, what it means? Um, again, it's a very inexpensive way to test your uh, applications, especially if you're working with new materials or you're getting a model from somebody uh, that you need to make a mold of and you're not sure what's on the model. Before making that mold and spending uh, the, the time, effort, and money to make that mold, a small scale test will give you a much better idea if that is even going to work. So we're going to get the, let this set up, and we're going to come back to it in a minute uh, to show you guys what the results of that look like. We're going to move on to the next topic, which is going to be how to choose the appropriate silicone for your project. And if you watch some of our other videos, you'll hear me talking about keeping the end result, the goal in mind whenever you start a project. What that means is you want to understand where you want to go with the final piece. What is it going to look like before you get there, before you start making decisions on mold making, silicones, casting, and all that. So your project criteria will be really important for the overall success. You want to the, determine the end result ahead of time so you know what you're aiming for. For instance, does your mold need to be uh, food grade? Does it need to be transparent? Does it have to be skin safe? Uh, does it have to be a certain color? All those aspects you want to think about before you start your molding project. That way you have a successful path that you're going to uh, materialize just by knowing how these things are going to work out down the line. Now, once you have the project criteria determined and you know which uh, direction you want to head into, you want to start thinking about materials and the material criteria on itself. And what I mean by that is uh, what material criteria or what criteria does the material that I'm using actually have? Or uh, Reda said, I make choices on materials based on the criteria. What's the viscosity? What's the durometer? What's the working time? Is it a tin? Is it a platinum? What additives are available for this uh, material that I can use for my project? Those are all important aspects uh, that you guys need to make uh, choices on, and we're going to help you m uh, navigate those choices and minimize them so that you don't have to play guessing games. So um, on the viscosity, I want to touch up on that a little bit more uh, here. It's really important to understand how the material will flow. Uh, so if you choose a product that has a very high viscosity, it's not going to flow well into a mold. If you have a very small opening and you're trying to pour a very thick material, you're going to notice that it's going to clog up really easily you're not going to be able to pour material into that mold. So really important to think about those things ahead of time before you actually get to the point. Now, what are some of the materials that are available to you? How to choose from all the different products that we do have available on our website? So there is a link down in the description below that will take you to our material charts, 
which I think were a great addition to our website. Basically, you can select a product that you want to use, if that's silicone, as a urethane, epoxies, and we'll bring, uh, bring up all the material in that uh, family and lay them out across so that you can see what are the working times, what are the mixing ratios, what are the cure times, what's the viscosity, very, very important. Uh, what's the durometer? Um, so all that is going to be lined up for you that you can easily look over that information uh, without having to guess which material may or may not work for you. So once you have that narrowed down, then you'll have a much better uh, understanding of the materials that you're going to be using and how they're going to behave and work for your application. I'm just going to get a sip of my tea. So something else that you want to consider when choosing materials, silicones for your application, is the uh, life expectancy, the library life of the material that it's going to have. And um, that's going to be important because you don't want to make something that's going to break down in three, four, five years. You might want to make something that's going to last uh, 25, 30 years as a display unit, such as this one right here. It's made out of platinum silicone. And this piece is going to last a very long time. This is going to be um, fine to, to pull and stretch for 25, 30 years without any issues because it's made out of platinum silicone. Nice and soft cheeks. So it's really important to keep those things in mind. Using the wrong material can uh, lead to failure of the final castings uh, much sooner than you were anticipated and also that will of course lead to unhappy customers or even yourself with the material and just based on the choices of product that you made. So really important to choose and understand the materials that you're choosing for these projects. Now let's talk about uh, material processing a little bit and what that actually means, right? So when, when we're handling these materials, we are processing the product. Uh, when we're processing materials, we actually introduce air into the system. So when you're doing the mixing of the A and B together, you're actually introducing air into the material. And that air is most likely going to stay trapped there, again, depending on the material you're using. If you're using a low viscosity rubber, a lot of that air is going to naturally degas, rise and degas out of the material on its own, and you don't have to think much about it. Uh, I'll give you a good example. We have a product that's called Dragon Skin 10 NV. The NV stands for no vacuum. That means low viscosity. I can easily mix and pour, and the material will naturally degas on its own, trapping a very minimal amount of air bubbles. Now, how can we improve our material processing? When we purchase stuff from the store and it comes in and it looks nice and perfect, you know, the cup is clear, um, that's because the material uh, was processed either under pressure, under vacuum, it was pressure injected to make it perfect, to minimize any kind of waste that's going to come uh, from that. You want to think about these aspects of material yourself when you're handling them, especially if you're reselling these castings or you want to just have the ultimate strength of a product. You want to think about it because the more air you trap in a material, the, the, the weaker the product is going to be. It's not going to have the same stretchiness. It might even rip. So you want to remove some of that air out of the product before you pour it. And what I'm getting to is vacuum degassing, pressure casting. Those are the things that we can do even in our garage shop, in our studio. All you need is a little vacuum pump for vacuuming the material, vacuuming the air. And then depending on your projects, what you're working on, here I have a little vacuum chamber. This is a two gallon vacuum chamber. They also come in a five gallon that we have available and also larger from different manufacturers. But this is a very basic setup 
to remove some of that air out of the material so that you can produce better casting, so that you can minimize any kind of wasted material, any kind of uh, uh, wasted casting, failed castings, by simply using uh, a vacuum degasser and a vacuum chamber to remove that air before pouring it into your molds. All right, I'm going to put this down and out of the way. I'll show you guys how to use the vacuum chamber as well in a little bit. We're going to be vacuuming a product called Sort of Clear 18, which is a uh, Sort of Clear product. It's uh, semi-translucent, but uh, it's very thick and traps a lot of air. And uh, I actually brought you guys a sample to see. So here I have two gaskets that I made out of silicone. This is uh, Sort of Clear 18. In my right hand here, I'm holding a gasket that has a lot of air bubbles trapped in it, and uh, it's actually quite uh, whitish. It's not very translucent. So you can see there's air bubbles. You can even see them on the surface there. All right? Lots of air bubble trapment in that one. Whereby, if we look at this one here, you can actually see my fingers through it clearly. And the air bubbles have been vacuumed prior and the material just simply poured into the same mold, open face, no pressure, and we got a much better quality uh, product out of the vacuum degas material versus the unvacuumed. So you can see the difference between uh, the, the pour or, or not handling the material with a vacuum and just pouring it and one that's actually handled with a vacuum and has a much better clarity to it. And here again, just an example of what that would look like. Here's the uh, retainer cups. Remember I told you I save my retainer cups from the mixing. One of them is completely filled with air bubbles. You can see the surface is just littered with them and you cannot see through the material even though it's called sort of clear. Whereby the other one right here, same material, you can see my fingers through it. It actually is sort of clear. And there's no bubbles that are trapped in the actual molding product. So these are my retainer cups that I saved just in case I needed to double check my work, but also just to show you guys what vacuum versus unvacuum material would look like. All right. I'll put these right here. So uh, we also want to touch up on colorant. Um, and painting. So there is a product like silicone pigment available to you uh, and other additives that you can either add into the silicone itself to create many different color options. Or if you need to um, thin out the material uh, to make it more fluid, there's also uh, silicone uh, thinners that are available for purchase. We also have Novox, uh, which, uh, which you can use to either add gloss or add a matte finish to your casting, or you can use also to thin down the silicone. But you also hear me uh, use stuff like naphtha and campfire fuel, which are um, uh, uh, things that other mold makers and casters utilize that I have learned from and I continue to use as well. So there is uh, material uh, coloring choices that you have as well that you have to make a decision on before starting a project like that. You can always um, choose a silicone that's clear and add pigment to it, or if you're looking for a very specific color that's already available, there is pig, uh, silicones that are pre-pigmented and ready to go the, in a color very specific. So, um, Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do a little casting demo. Actually, I want to go ahead and show you guys the results of the small scale test that we just ran before we move on. So we have here a 3D print that we poured the Echoflex over. Uh, why did I pour it over this? There is some 3D prints that are known to inhibit silicone, so I wanted to make sure that this one doesn't. And it does feel very cured on the surface. Uh, I can simply peel it off which is a good indicator there's no issues with this material. There's no tackiness on the material. So I know that the 3D prints here are good to be made molds off. So that's good. 
Next here we have the block of clay. That also seems to set up fine. I'll just peel that back. Again, there's no tackiness left on the back of this silicone or the clay itself. So that's a good result. So we know we can use that clay as well in the shop. And finally, the uh, tooling board here, which I'm a little skeptical about, but it seems okay. Yep. So a little bit more difficult to peel off because it is a porous surface, but it also set up just fine. There's no tackiness on the back of this. And I know that this particular uh, tooling board will work with the material that I want to use for this project. So there you go. A small scale test gives you a very concrete, very straightforward answer to if your model is going to work with the specific material that you have chosen for that project. All right, we're going to move that aside. Now, we're going to show you a quick demo on casting into what we call scar plates. I have two molds here for you that I picked out. And the first thing that you may notice is the molds are different color. Yes, they are. Uh, second thing you might notice, one is flexible and the other one is not. It's just a rigid plate. All right, so this is a urethane uh, Smoothcast 300 urethane resin. This is a platinum silicone Moldstar, uh, Moldstar 16, I believe that is, uh, mold. So we have two molds here, and one thing that I know is this is platinum, so I know for sure I'm pouring platinum silicone into this, which is going to be the, uh, let's see, we're going to pour the dragon skin 10NV into one of the molds, and the other mold we're going to do the Ecoflex 0030, 0045, the near clear. Um, so this. So we know automatically we don't need a release agent for the rigid mold. Uh, the material will not adhere to it. It will not inhibit from the urethane. So I know for sure I can just go ahead, mix the material up, pour it into my mold, and let it cure. The second mold, the silicone mold, I know surely that because it's platinum, that the platinum silicone is going to want to bond to it. So first thing you want to do is apply a release agent. Now, you do have a couple of choices for release agents. We have the uh, East Release 200, which is the black and yellow can that you guys are probably familiar with. It looks like this. This is Ease Release 200. You're going to use this on silicone to silicone applications. This is an aerosol can. Oh, you got a little nozzle there. And whenever you're using the uh, aerosol can for application, we do uh, application of spray and brush with a dry brush and then spray again the model to apply the release. Your other option would be the East Release 205, which uh, it's a liquid version of the 200, so you would shake it up, it's a liquid, you pour it into a cup and then apply it with a brush only. Um, what I like about the liquid version, you have a lot more control with the brush where you're actually applying the release agent. Uh, good uh, release agent to have in the shop. And finally, I want to show you also this concoction here. This is isopropyl alcohol with uh, dish detergent that I mixed um, in the FAQ that you're going to find on our website and in the description below. There is actually FAQ on how to make your own uh, release agent using isopropyl alcohol and dish detergent. This one here is blue, smells like uh, the dishwasher and alcohol combined together. And when you are applying this material, uh, of course, I don't have a brush. Uh, could you, Alex, grab me a chip brush? When you're applying the alcohol a solution, uh, it's important that you don't over apply the material. You don't want to have a puddle sitting in your mold and collecting and pooling. Thank you, sir. So what we want to do is brush on 
some of the release agent onto the mold and then what I like to do is just kind of shake it out make sure that there's no liquid that's actually sitting in any crevices and then we're going to allow this about 15 to 30 minutes depending on how much you applied on there to uh, to dry before applying any fresh silicone over that so I'm going to actually let that sit for a couple of minutes while we go ahead and mix some of the uh, Ecoflex near clear and cast it into the scar plate if you guys have any questions feel free to just ask um, Jason is going to then communicate those questions to me and I can answer them for you. So Near Clear 45 is a, again, platinum silicone. It is a clear base. It has a mix ratio of one to one by volume. So I don't need to use a gram scale. I can simply go ahead and dispense my material. I think this looks better. There you go. A and B, A and B. One to one by volume. So we can go ahead and mix some material up and we're going to uh, cast it into the scar plate. Now, whenever you are working on skin related topics like uh, masks, scar plates, wounds, the key to uh, making them realistic is not to add too much pigment into the material, into the silicone. Uh, to make it look fake. Just close together, one to one. That looks good. One question that did come through is about the um, amount of alcohol to soap solution. Mm -hmm. um, I've always done about four parts alcohol to one part dish soap. Um, just because I, you know, I, I like to have a real thin layer. Right. Of, uh, so the question layer. that came in is, what's the mix ratio of alcohol to the dish soap? And um, there is a prescribed uh, um, mix ratio that we have again in the FAQ that you can find on that specific topic. Um, but Jason mentioned he uses a four to one, so four alcohol to one uh, dish detergent mix ratio. I use, uh, I think it's a two or three to one, uh, but every mold maker is going to be a little bit different. Just keep in mind, the more alcohol you have, the thinner the uh, application of that detergent is going to be. Um, and speaking of, of that, actually uh, came to my mind, I totally forget because I am a human being after all, our silicone pigments. Um, you can also use... Uh, Petroleum jelly can be used as a release agent in a pinch. Uh, I would uh, strongly suggest to thin it out because it is very pasty and will leave thick strokes uh, where you're applying it. So a lot of times we will thin it out with a mineral spirit uh, to make it a more liquid. All right, well, I got a couple of the silk pigs out here. And remember, uh, you want to add small quantities off the silicone pigments so that you don't overpower the silicone. And what I like to do, after I open my pigment, I'll break up the mixing stick into smaller sticks. Uh, sometimes they have really fine needle points, and that's what I actually use to dispense the quantity of of the uh, pigment. So there is actually pigment on the tip of that. I'm just going to add that into the silicone. Again, don't need a lot, just a little bit. And you can see that the silicone base has some color to it, uh, but it's, it's very faint. It's very translucent. So that's what you're aiming for when mixing uh, silicone for mask wound application and then uh, because this uh, does not look realistic to me I'm gonna add a little bit of brown again you can add many different colors to create a specific skin tone that you're aiming for and 
again, using a pointy little toothpick style, just a very, very little amount on top of that tip. Well, you can see that's not changing the color too much. It's very subtle, but I am getting a uh, flesh tone more and more. So it's much better to ease into the uh, addition of the pigment. You can add small amount, small amount, small amount, uh, then adding a lot of uh, pigment in one shot, and then you're going to overpower that mixed batch, and it's going to look very fakish. So you want to avoid that by adding small quantities off the material. So we have some pigment pre-mixed already. Um, I don't need to use a clean mixing cup in this case. I'm just going to add one to the other. And we're going to do a double mix. So I'm adding the B to the A because I'm trying to save some mixing containers. I mix that. And before I pour it into the scar plate that we have set up, now remember, it's really important keeping that working time in mind uh, off the material before you start mixing the A and B together. And what I'm going to do is actually take a second cup and pour that in there and do my double mix because the working time off this material allows me enough time to mix, pour into a secondary mixing container, and now double mix. This is again a very cheap insurance policy that you're mixing the two components well together. And just like I did earlier, you want to scrape the sides and scrape the bottom off that mixing container. Now, just so I don't make a mess here, because we will be scraping off some of the extra material off of these molds, I'll put a piece of paper down. Go like this. And that one. So this mold is ready for silicone as well. But first we're going to pour the 0045 here. And when you are making scar plates like this, there we are, it's good to use a squeegee tool like that, flexible. Your scar plate is very flat and actually shaped so that once we pour the silicone into the scar plates, I'm just going to pour right on top, very liquid, it will degas on its own. Maybe a little bit more down here. So what you want to do is take the squeegee tool and then scrape right over the wounds that you just poured into. All right, let's not make a mess here. Now what this does, this type of application is it flattens the uh, outer edges of these castings so that when you demold these and you're applying them to the actors that are going to be wearing uh, these wounds, those edges off the wound blend in very well with the rest of their skin because the edges around here are going to be very thin and easy to blend when you're applying it to, uh, to the person that's going to be wearing it. So you can see that the silicone flowed very well into the mold. It was easy to mix, pour, and scrape. And uh, the air bubbles that were trapped in it from the mixing procedure are easily going to rise to the back of these castings on their own and just pop because the material is, again, very liquid, low viscosity, and um, has a long setting time. And uh, actually, I can literally look into the mold and see how the little air bubbles are rising to the top and popping slowly. They're just popping and releasing, so it's a very good sign that this is fine. And we're going to swap over, and we're going to mix a batch of the Dragon Skin 10 NV. This is a 10A durometer silicone, unlike the Ecoflex, which is a double zero. It's a di different shore scale. 
Um, this is a little bit firmer. However, it also uh, has a low viscosity. It's a no vacuum, NV, 10 NV. Material, one to one mix ratio. And most importantly also, it is translucent, so it is easy to pigment with our uh, colorants. So, a couple of mix, uh, dispensing cups here. I'll mix these up, so A here, B there. And I'm going to, again, dispense by volume, even amount. And we're going to add to that also a little bit of pigment. Again, I'm just breaking my mixing stick here to create a thin needle-like uh, application of the silicone pigment. Uh, again, we're going to use the flesh tone, silk pig flesh. Small quantity of this will go a long way, so that's how much we're adding. And once again, you want to add a small quantity, see how it looks like in the silicone once you mix it. And then if you're not happy with that, you can add a little bit more. So red go in steps and add small quantities, then overload it. And then you have to add more silicone, what you may not even need or use. And then it's just wasted product. We did have a question come in about um, getting rid of the air bubbles. Mm -hmm. Um, with a resin casting, you can use a heat gun mm -hmm. to kind of pop those bubbles. What would you do if it's even necessary on a silicone casting? So the question came in, um, you can get rid of uh, air bubbles on the back of resin castings by he uh, using a heat gun, uh, a blowtorch. I have also seen people just spray the back of the resin casting with a uh, release agent and pop the bubbles that way. Um, for the silicone, it's a little bit different. Um, if the silicone is liquid enough on its own, the air bubbles are going to rise to the top and pop on their own, again, if it's liquid, and also if the work time allows it. If their work time is short, the material is just going to solidify it and freeze those air bubbles in the material. Uh, for the silicone, you, you could use a torch, but I don't recommend it because you actually will be uh, burning the top layer or even solidifying the top layer because it will activate with heat. Um, again, it will be a key to use a liquid product and to make sure that it has a long enough work time. The other option you have, again, if you saw the vacuum pump, it would be to vacuum the gas material and then pour it if the working time allows it. And uh, I know that there is other options out there that people have uh, used and done uh, to get rid of those air bubbles. We're in a constant uh, learning phase when we're working with these materials. So something that uh, you might do at home, we might not do here and vice versa. And you might be using uh, something that we're not aware about, uh, but that works very well. So the community, the artist community, will share that information. If you're part of a community online, on uh, social media, uh, they always share those types of uh, information with others, or people will just simply ask the question. So my answer to that would be vacuum degassing, use a material that has a long work time and is very liquid, uh, very viscous. Um, but again, you guys out there might have other options, other experiences. And again, feel free to share them with us. Uh, let us know in the comments what you do to get rid of the air bubbles from the back of your silicone castings. All right, so we pre-mixed our pigment here. And you can see that has a very nice skin tone color. I like that. And now I'm ready to mix the two components together. And then we're going to pour them into our mold. Grab a clean mixing container. And the only reason why I'm not pouring here one into the other is because there's a lot of material and I don't want to make a mess by using too small of a container. 
one component and the other. And just like we did previously, you're going to scrape the sides and scrape the bottom of your mixing container to incorporate them too well together. And because I have enough working time with this particular product, I'm also going to go ahead and uh, double mix the material. So I'm going to take the mixed product, pour it into a clean mixing container, and then mix it again. Now, before you even ask me, uh, can I uh, repurpose these containers? Can I reuse these containers? Uh, that really comes down to how well you mixed. Uh, if this solidifies just fine and you can peel the material out, there's no tackiness at the bottom. I see no, uh, no reason why you shouldn't be using that container again. Uh, but if you didn't mix, there will be residue down and below that's not solidified that could up, uh, upset the chemistry of your next batch. So just something you want to be aware about. And we'll give this another quick mix. Now, if you did have um, leftover silicone that's completely cured, right? Mm -hmm. And you remove it from the container, what mm -hmm. could you do with that? Uh -huh. So the question is, if I have silicone left in the mixing container after my pour and you let it solidify and it is fine, uh, what can you do with that silicone? Uh, I was going to bring you guys, I'm pretty sure I have it in my other videos, but what I do is I use that silicone as a uh, knife pillow. So I will have, actually what I can do, this has plenty of working time so I don't have to worry. Again, understanding the material is really important. Um, here's my uh, retainer cup from the earlier batch, Ecoflex 0035 that we mixed. Uh, I have a mixing stick stuck in here, but let's go ahead and pull this out if we can. So here we have a leftover silicone puck, what I call. Ugh, this guy did really bad mixing. So here is a good example of uh, <laughs> cure inhibition. So you can see here at the bottom of the ring, there is some tackiness here. That means that material was not mixed properly. So there's a little bit of tackiness down at the bottom. But uh, to answer your question, what can you do with a silicone puck like this? I usually use them for my knives, uh, just so you guys see here. I have a larger one downstairs and I literally take all my razor knives in the shop and I stick them in there. And I usually have several knives in one of these. Um, that's what I kind of store my knives in so I don't cut myself. Uh, it's a good use of it. Uh, the other thing that I recommend as far as uh, having excess extra silicone that you can use for other things is have some smaller molds ready to go. Have a couple, um, uh, what do you call them, coasters, uh, cup coasters uh, uh, that you can make in those molds so that you don't waste all that silicone. Uh, something that I have, I have a small rigid mold for a dish soap. So every time I have silicone left over, I'll pour a little dish soap and I usually give it to my friends and family as little gadgets, thank yous, and they appreciate it as well and makes me feel good when I go to their house and I see that they're actually using them. So uh, the material here, we're going to go ahead and pour it. Again, keeping the working time off these materials in mind, really important. And again, because this is a very low viscosity, we can just go ahead and pour it onto the model, onto the mold in this case. And then using a squeegee tool, once again, we're going to flatten the back of that scar plate. Now, you guys might notice there is a channel around this mold here. So there's a channel around the actual wound plate. Uh, that channel serves two, uh, two functions. First, uh, it catches the material, the extra material, 
uh, that we're pushing around, but that also makes it easier to remove that scar plate out of it because you have a, 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 a frame that you can pull on. And also when you're applying it then to the actors and you're applying the wound to the actors, uh, that's easier to handle by having that frame on the outer side. So you put your adhesive right in the middle here and then you have that frame to kind of handle that uh, prosthetic as you're applying it to the actors. So there you have it. Um, this is Dragon's Skin 10 NV and the Near Clear 45. As you can see, that was very easy to use, one-to-one -one mix ratios by volume. No gram scale was necessary there. Uh, low viscosity materials that pour very easily. Uh, I didn't need to vacuum the gasset and uh, because they were translucent, they were also easy to color. So, uh, put these aside. In the meantime, if you guys have any questions, please let me know. I'd love to hear from you guys, even if you just let us know where you're from, where you're watching us from. Uh, it's always interesting to see where our customers are located. So I'm going to just put these aside. Because these have a longer cure time, they're not going to cure up in the next couple of minutes that I can demold these in front of you guys. But we will put them aside so we can move on with our presentation. We don't need the paper either. Okay. All right. And also the pigments are going to be moved. All right, so let's talk about applications. What are some of the applications to silicones that you guys will see in uh, the everyday world? Um, you can see on my left here, there are some castings of uh, many different applications that you would see in the everyday world. Uh, we have everything from uh, props, uh, life-size props that are soft to the touch. We have silicone masks. Uh, that are also soft to the touch and easy to put on. We have uh, masks in general and uh, also industrial pieces. There's a lot of times you're going to find gaskets that are made out of silicone. And especially if you need like a food, gr uh, food grade uh, rating on your silicone, you're going to opt for a product like silicone that has a food rating um, to make these kinds of uh, applications. So this, this gasket right here is from a food processing machine. Uh, more specifically, this is for a meat processing machine. So you can imagine that a lot of meat is going to be going passing through here. And it, it, once it touches the gasket, you want to make sure that this material will not uh, off gas or add anything into the meat into the uh, food supply, so you want to opt out for food grade materials uh, that these gases, gaskets particularly are made out of. So industrial applications as well as uh, movie industry, uh, one of the biggest uh, industries that will use silicones is also the medical simulation industry. So here I'm holding a heart. This is a silicone heart, squishy but very realistic and very well painted actually. So this will be a great uh, uh, simulation piece for uh, medical students uh, to practice, to learn from. Uh, but other applications in the medical industry, here is a injection pad for needles um, made out of super soft silicone, very squishy. Uh, this is representing the fatty layer uh, as well as the muscle layer or, or meat layer underneath. So different materials can be used for different applications within the same industries. And I'm actually going to show you guys how to make a sutra pad uh, for learning how to cut and stitch uh, us, I guess. So th those are some of the applications that you will see. Uh, food displays is a really nice uh, food display that we made. Here's a, this is a silicone chicken. It looks pretty realistic. With the right packaging, it can go on a shelf and be displayed uh, and not worry about having the actual piece rot. It will just sit on the shelf for the next 30 years and look absolutely the same. Some of the other industries that utilize uh, silicone products is the aquarium industry. So you'll see 
aquarium pieces like this, a lot of times they make them so that the silicone casting can easily wave in the water. So when the water waves are going through there, this will be motion, motioning, it will be moving, making the aquarium uh, come uh, to life much better and also just make it look more realistic. And please let me know if you guys know of any industries that uh, you uh, have seen these materials being used in and for. Um, some of the other industries that I'm very well aware about, uh, bushings for mechanical applications. So these are silicone bushings. This is a 40 or 50. This is a 50 durometer. You can see it's quite hard, whereby this is a 30 durometer, much softer and also add a different pigment into it and different fillers to give it a different kind of look. So something like this you would see a lot in uh, the automotive industry uh, where they use these for um, steering uh, bushings and all kind of bushings that go into the uh, drivetrain off the vehicle. Uh, a lot of times these will, uh, cust customers will custom-made these to, to dampen or stiffen a specific part or uh, 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 mechanical part of their vehicle. So very common in the uh, industry to use silicone. Uh, something else here I want to show you are silicone hoses. So the, I made these myself just to kind of show you guys uh, what they would look like and I even reinforced them with some uh, cloth on the inside. So these are very durable very strong and you again you will see these in the industry for many different applications from automotive to industrial and so on so the the type of uh, products that you can make out of silicone is usually much bigger than you would actually imagine in real life uh, again you can see some of these castings uh, that we have made and previously here's a respirator made uh, out of silicone and we have a video on this as well, if you guys want to check out the video. So we made a rigid tool mold out of smooth cast, I believe it was, and casting it, the parts themselves, out of silicone. Again, the tool not requiring any release agent. We can just cast into it and pull the, the castings out. All right. So those are some of the examples that you would see uh, of, of silicone in everyday usage. Uh, there's much more. There's a much wider industry uh, that you would ever imagine that uses these products, but we're just not aware about it because we don't see it in a regular daily day-to-day uh, -day basis. So while they might be used, you might not know, hey, there is uh, silicone gaskets or bushings in there that are made out of silicone. Uh, so it's a very versatile product that can be uh, used for many different applications and also can be made to look like different things. So here you have a silicone pad that we added some fillers to and it looks almost metallic. You would not think that this is actually flexible, but it actually is. It's, it's silicone. But with the addition of different pigment and different filler, in this case the cast magics, uh, you can make the material look like many other things that they're not. And again, based on what your needs are, you can go with different colors, you can keep the clarity of the material, you can choose different durometers based on your needs. This is a much stiffer piece, much stiffer uh, rubber than this one here is. Again, it all comes down to your project criteria and what you're trying to achieve with these products. And just uh, to show you a couple more examples that I have uh, set up for you guys here. Again, silicone gaskets. I'm just going to show you these. From clear to colored, from different durometers, they're uh, very versatile and they're, again, in many different industries uh, that they're employed. And once again, I want to bring up the food industry. This is an octopus that they made a mold off of, and you can see that it reproduced uh, the detail of uh, the original quite well. This can be now painted and used as a display unit and look very realistic. 
A couple other examples that I'm very eager to show you guys because it just displays the possibility of what's uh, possible with these material here. So here's a garter snake, I think. Um, this was out of silicone, so it's flexible, soft, but it looks very realistic. And if you turn this over, you can see that the base of this casting is actually white. So it's white silicone, and then all the detail as far as the painting itself on top was actually done with psycho paint and silicone pigment, silk pigs, to make the casting itself very realistic and quite scary. Another industry that you're going to see uh, materials like this being used as the tattoo industry. Uh, I like this piece a lot because it uh, gives the artists a chance to practice without having to, um, you know, purchase uh, pigskin or <laughs> have their best friend sit down for a tattoo session and it's their first time tattooing. So silicone castings like this make it possible for tattoo artists to express their work, practice their skill without having to sacrifice somebody's skin, but rather right, use a silicone casting. Quite interesting here. The gaskets that you showed before, um, what's the heat resistance on a gasket or a bushing that's made the with The gaskets glass? that I showed before, again here, I'm just going to lay out a couple of uh, options as far as what you would see in the everyday world uh, for gaskets. So the question is, What's the heat deflection on a gasket like this? Um, silicones in general, uh, especially platinum silicones, I believe, have a heat deflection of 450 Fahrenheit um, that they will withstand. There are some silicones that have a higher heat deflection. If you uh, look at the Mold Max 60, that has, I think, 560 Fahrenheit. So it's very specific for a very specific application. Uh, so we made it extra heat resistant. But uh, general silicone will have a heat deflection in the 400 to 450 Fahrenheit um, that, that it will withstand. So a very durable product. Uh, but you cannot pour liquid metals into silicones, just so you guys know, because I'm sure that question is going to come up sooner or later, because I get it actually quite frequently. All right, so I showed you guys some examples of uh, everyday use for these uh, castings, uh, sorry, for silicones. Again, if you have uh, questions or if you just want to make a comment as far as where you experience and where you saw the um, materials being used, let us know. Uh, we cannot think of every application and every use for these products. So I'm going to set up and do a quick demo for you guys on the Sorta Clear. And we're actually going to pour a gasket. So we're going to use a 3D printed mold to pour the Sorta Clear 18 into. Now, if you remember from earlier, I, we, we talked a little bit about 3D prints that can inhibit the cure uh, of materials. I've actually coated this with uh, XTC and uh, I applied release agent to it as well. Uh, one thing you want to uh, make sure is to follow the technical bulletin on any product you're using. So using the XTC requires the use of release agents. So the silicone gaskets coming out of here are going to have a release agent that's already applied into the mold. But more importantly, I wanted to talk about the Sort of Clear 18. The biggest difference you're going to see between this and the previous product is the actual size of the container. Let's try that A, B, how better? All right. Um, the sizes of the container indicate one thing. You're going to add more of this and less of that. So this mix ratio is actually 10 to 1. So 10 parts of the A, uh, one part of the B, or uh, 100 to 10, same thing. Uh, so we do need to use a gram scale, an accurate gram scale for this. And just before I pull that out, Keep up on my water. We're using an accurate gram scale for dispensing of these products. As you might remember, I mentioned that this uh, product specifically is very thick. It has a very high viscosity, and I will show you what I mean by that. 
So what, what that indicates to me is that this product will easily trap air bubbles. And those air bubbles then will uh, ruin our cast, and ruin our piece that we're working on. It will not be to satisfaction and we will have to remake it. All right. Put our dispensing containers and a mixing stick. And we're going to zero out the scale. All right. So, as I mentioned, the shorter clear is quite thick, right? So, here's the material. So, uh, you can see the glare in there and one thing you might notice this material is not moving I mean there's not a lot of movement in there I can literally hold it upside down and that thing will not move that's high viscosity right there for you see how slowly that is creeping and oh, we won't let it spill out uh, but that is high viscosity this is something again that you want to be aware about before you purchase the material before you start working with it uh, if you receive this in the mail and you start to use it and realize you, you can't process it, it's too thick, then you're not going to have a good time with this material. So I'm going to show you how I go about processing the, the Sort of Clear 18. We're going to start by dispensing 200 grams in our dispensing cup. And I literally have to use a mixing stick to get some of that out. Here we go. It's flowing. I do 200 grams of the part A. Really important to have an accurate gram scale that measures past the gram. All right, we got a little bit too much. Take some of that out. There we go. 200 grams part A. And then we're going to add how much? How much uh, part B are we adding to the 200 grams of the part A? I'm looking for answers here. Help me out. And uh, I could go ahead and mix it, uh, dispense it into a clean container, the, the part B here. Uh, but I'm just going to add it to the part A because, again, it has a long working time, so I know that. Um, I don't have to worry about rushing uh, with the material. I can simply zero out the scale. Bring it back to zero. So even though there's material on there, the scale is at zero. And then uh, how much of the part uh, B are we adding? Anybody? Premix, shake. Nobody knows. Nobody's screaming. All right, we're going to add 20 grams of the part B. And you want to be careful because once you dispense it, you can't really undispense it. You can't go back. All right, there it is, 20 grams. So 100 to 10 means 200 grams of A and 20 grams of B. And I can go ahead and put my gram scale away from now. And we're going to go ahead and mix the two components together. Now, take a look quickly uh, at this material. One thing you notice is that it's quite clear at this point. You don't see a lot of air bubbles in there. You can actually see the bottom of the table, right? Now, what's going to happen once we start mixing this material? We're introducing air into that mixture, right? And just like we did previously, scrape the sides and scrape the bottom of the mixing container. Make sure you incorporate, incorporate those two components well together. And take a look at the silicone now. It has literally changed from translucent to pretty much white or uh, opaque. And that's the air bubbles that are trapped in that material. There's just so much air that it's hindering the light and vision to pass through it. Uh, again, because we have a lot of work time, I'm going to double mix that. So we're going to transfer it into a second clean mixing container. And if you notice one thing right now, the container is going from uh, medium to large. Anybody know why? 
Remember, we're using vacuum degassing, and what happens is when you're pulling the material, when you're pulling air out of this material, it will rise, and it will easily overflow this container. So you want to have plenty of space about twice to, to four times the amount of space for the silicone to expand into. And you'll see that in a minute, I hope. Yes, sir. Um, what if you were to add some silicone thinner into this? We have the, that silicone thinner that will reduce the viscosity. Does that help with the bubbles? So the question is, if we add silicone thinner to this uh, material, will it help with the bubbles? Absolutely. It will bring the viscosity from, I think it's 30,000 CPS or something like that. Let's see. Always have your technical bulletins handy. They're really handy. So let's take a look. Uh, sort of clear 18. Uh, mixed viscosity is 21,000 CPS. So that's the information I'm looking for right there. So by adding silicone uh, thinner to this 20,000 CPS, I can add 10% of the silicone thinner to the entire uh, weight of that batch. Again, keep your uh, working time in mind. Don't let it expire in a cup. Um, you can add about 10% or up to 10% of silicone thinner to your batch. Uh, that will do a few things. It will make your material more viscous, more liquid, which will allow the natural degassing to happen much uh, easier on its own, so no vacuum degassing. But you're not going to be able to lower the viscosity to such a point where you're just not going to trap air in a thick material like this. It's just not going to happen. It's way too thick. You can make the material flow a lot better, um, but it's not going to give you the, the, the viscosity you're looking for for a pour. Um, furthermore, the addition of the silicone thinner will change the material somewhat. It will soften it just a tad, so it'll be a little bit softer than an 18. It might be a 16A. And also, it will weaken the tear resistance of the material based on how much uh, silicone thinner you added. So if you want to keep the properties of a product to what is specified in the technical bulletin, then you don't want to add any additives. All right, so... Again, this material is now double mixed. It's full of air bubbles. And if we pour this silicone gasket now, it will just come out uh, full of air bubbles, just like I showed you guys earlier. Let me see if I can find that sample again. It's a complete mess here. There's too many castings. I have several of them, but I don't have the one that, that was full of air bubbles. Where did that go? So what we want to do is remove that air. And to do that, I'm going to show you guys quickly how to vacuum the gas using a vacuum pump and a vacuum chamber. So this is a very uh, basic setup here. It's a two gallon chamber and a regular vacuum pump. Keep in mind, the vacuum pump does have some requirements, uh, what it needs to do. Uh, it does need to be able to pull 29 inches of mercury, and we'll show you how that looks like. So we're going to go ahead and remove the lid, put our mixed material into the vacuum chamber, close that up, and then we can go ahead and start the vacuum pump. We're going to add... There we go. And you can watch the needle here as it travels. There we go. So you can watch that the needle is moving towards the 30. So we're looking to vacuum that material and remove all that air. And you can actually watch inside. There we go. <laughs> you can see the material is rising, right? You can see it rising. And we want to make sure it doesn't overflow. So it's rising to the top. I'm going to break that, add some air, 
and then go right back to it so we broke that allowed it now to go back up and we're looking for a fall once it stops rising there it is so now it's starting to actually fall we uh, removed most of the air out of the material and there it is the collapse so the material has now removed most of the air out of it we're going to continue to vacuum the gas this for another 90 seconds to give the material plenty of time to actually remove most of the air out of it. Sounds like a Yugo running. All right. We're going to stop that vacuum pump and then we can reapply air into our material. And that material is now just going to slump all the way down. And once you take that material out of the cup, it just takes a second to all that to go away. All right. You're going to still see some air bubbles in that material, right? Uh, the key here is that you have removed about 90% of the air bubbles out of that product. There are still some air bubbles visible. Now, those are going to get rid of by simply pouring the material and allowing those few bubbles then to slowly rise to the top of the mixing, uh, of the, the, the mold itself. So I'm going to go ahead and pour into this uh, 3D printed mold that I've already prepped. And usually what I do is I would allow the material to hit in one spot and fill the entire mold. However, because this material is quite thick, I'm going to move with the cavities off the mold and just go ahead and fill that. Now, once you break the material over the lip here, we're going to let it drop into a, a thin stream. This is called needling. That also allows some of the air bubbles that are trapped in the material to actually break while they're going over the lip of the cup. When the, the material gets stretched in a thin stream and stretches those air bubbles. Oh, and see that stream? It actually, actually stretches the air bubbles and breaks them in the process of pouring. But you can see into the cup that most of those air bubbles have been removed and the material on its own is already looking a lot clearer than what it actually should. I'm just going to follow the pattern here off this mold. This is a very basic open face mold uh, anybody can make or print in this case pour the material into your mold and then have professional looking results just by understanding the material and following the best uh, procedures for handling the product. Which in this case for a product like the Sorta Clear 18 would be to either vacuum the gasset or potentially pressure cast it if you needed or had the opportunity to and possibility. So there it is. I poured the mold. I'm going to allow this now to set up fully. I'm also still going to keep my uh, mixing cup, my retainer cup, just so I can trace my work back in case there was any kind of issues that happened in that particular uh, mold. Now, I did already go ahead and pour uh, a gasket earlier for you guys. So here is a gasket that we made earlier just so we have something to work with. I'm going to go ahead and demold that for you. I need a little tool to pop it out. Yeah, an interesting point. Um, you could also pressure cast this silicone if you wanted to, correct? Right, so the question is, uh, could you pressure cast the silicone? Uh, the answer is, you could, yes. Uh, what's, the, what's the main of, uh, 
uh, issue that you're going to encounter if you're pressure casting is that the mold itself has to be made under pressure as well. So if you're using a mold that's not pressurized, you're not going to have a good result. You want to use a mold that's non-porous or made under pressure so that you don't have a negative result. But you see that the gasket that we poured earlier has really good clarity and the material was able, just by being vacuum degassed and poured, was able to get rid of the rest of those air bubbles and our casting looks fantastic. This is a really nice casting, clean, clear, and is ready to be used by the end user. So this would be a successful casting versus the one that I showed you earlier, which had all kinds of air bubbles and was not uh, deemed a success and was actually a failure. So sort of, sort of clear 18, a product that's a bit more difficult to handle just because its thickness, its viscosity, um, made easy just by understanding how to handle the material and make it work for your benefit. Um, I want to give you guys a really funny uh, story. When I started using these materials uh, with Smoothon, I poured some smooth cast 3 to 5 or 3 to 6, I think. And when I pulled the casting out, it was terrible. It had all kinds of air bubbles in it. I was not happy with it. And I said, well, this, this, this is not good. And uh, I really didn't think about the fact that I needed to, um, to, to pressurize the mold and then pressurize the casting that I was using in that mold. So, um, I, oh, look at that. Look what we found. So just quickly before we move on, I did find that gasket. I wanted to show you again the results between a good casting and a bad casting. Sometimes you just don't see the trees from the forest. Was the forest from the trees? Whatever. So again, here you have an example of what a product would look like that wasn't vacuum degassed and how many air bubbles it trapped versus a product that was simply uh, vacuum degassed and poured. So not much uh, difference as far as handling, just vacuum degassing, but gave us a much, much clearer, much better product in the end result. All right. So again, keep the questions coming, guys, if you have them. Let us know uh, how we're doing. Let us know any comments you have, or just simply say hello. All right. So next section that we're going to be talking about is molding material options. So for all the silicone that we're going to be using in our molds, we have some choices as far as what we're going to make the molds out of. Now, before I make any molds, I'm going to have a drink on the house. Now, what are some of the molding material choices that we have for silicones? Um, something that really comes easily to my mind is always thinking about the big guys, big industry, big machinery, are metal molds. Metal molds are used every day uh, for production of uh, plastics, uh, silicones, all kinds of stuff where the uh, casting material is injected into pressurized, heated molds to give uh, the castings coming out of the molds a much better chance and success. So uh, castings coming out of molds like that, that are pressurized, that are injected, that are heated, are going to have a much higher success rate. Uh, you know, they might have one failed casting for every hundred that they make. While you and I, working in our shop, in our garage, in the basement, we might make one for every ten uh, fails that we have. So material handling through the molds, through the equipment, is important to understand. So metal molds that are very expensive to set up and used for high volume productions are available to even you and I, but again, they're expensive. Uh, might not make sense if you're making only 10, 20, 100, uh, 200 castings. You might not uh, need to expense uh, and go into uh, making metal molds. Again, they're very expensive. Uh, what are some of the other options that you have? Uh, one would be stone molds. And what stone molds are? They're basically gypsum molds. Um, here I'm going to show you a couple of examples, very basic these are a couple of stone molds that I made for keys 
for mold making. These are made out of, I believe this was uh, hydrocal that these are made out of. Very simple block molds. These are, this one is two parts, so you have a lower and a top, whereby this one is just a single piece. Again, just poured, uh, allowed to dry, and once the material is fully dry, the plaster is dry, uh, the gypsum is dry, then you're going to go ahead and seal the mold using a clear sealant. Usually I use the cr uh, Krylon Crystal Clear on these. Uh, but remember, the, the, the um, gypsum has to be completely dried out. So give it a good uh, time to dry in a warm, dry spot before applying any sealer. Now, the good thing about these is you can cast into them without any release agent. So these are sealed. Uh, the silicone will not penetrate into it. And they will not be inhibited. And you can just pour the material into the mold. Here's a casting that came out of this mold that I actually use for uh, keys on my molds. So these are called ball keys. And I can snip these now off and then use them attach to attach to a silicone mold. So these are uh, stone molds uh, that are still actually used a lot by the um, uh, silicone mask and prosthetic industries, believe it or not. Uh, why? Because they're readily available, it's cheap, uh, but the downturn to that is that they're very heavy uh, and can break easily if you drop them. Uh, so the industry has more and more shifted to other forms of uh, rigid mold making for all kinds of different applications just because of the uh, material being, you know, uh, not, not as easy to work with once it's set up. But imagine if you have a mold, a stone mold, that is 30, 40 pounds and weight. Then you add another 10 pounds of casting material into it, and then you have to handle that mold somehow. Next thing you know, that thing is on the ground, broken. You wasted a lot of time and material. Um, a question came in about molds that are in multiple pieces, how you keep the silicone from leaking out. And I know there's some things you don't want to use, like um, silicone caulking or things like that to seal it up. Huh, um, interesting question well, here. Yeah. Uh, so the question came in, and I have actually good examples for that. Um, what do you do with seams uh, of rigid molds uh, where silicone actually can uh, leak out of? Uh, do you seal the edges with something uh, to prevent that from happening, or do you just let it happen? Uh, my... my uh, uh, way of doing things would be to just let that seep out. But that also depends on what type of mold is it, you know. Um, a mold like this of Slimer's arm, my buddy Slimer back there. So a mold like this is of a arm, it's in two parts, and I know that along this edge here, I'm gonna have a seam line. There's no way around it. When you put these two together, there's just no way where you can seal that perfectly that there's not going to be a seam line. Now, what can I caulk the, uh, sorry, what, what can I uh, seal this edge with? Uh, the number one thing that I would recommend that's readily available, oil-based clay. This is Sculptex oil-based clay. Uh, you just want to make sure that the oil-based clay you're using is sulfur-free, uh, and then you can literally just put a bead off the, the sculptics of the clay right on the edge of that mold. That will seal and prevent any of the silicone from actually leaking out. And then once you're done, you can just remove it and scrape it off um, and you can repurpose that uh, sculptics for either a mold box or something else or, or sculpt that you may have. But that's how I would seal them. Uh, the last thing that you want to do is use some kind of caulking, some kind of uh, silicone out of tubes, and try to s fill that gap, uh, causing several things. You can cause the material inside to now have a uh, cure inhibition along that edge for some reason. You can also cause the mold itself to now be stuck together and, and sealed or glued together because you use that caulking. 
And both of those would be negative experiences that you not want to uh, experience when, uh, when working with something like this. So it's much better to stick to stuff that, again, you know will not inhibit and will not cause you issues down the line. Good question there. I, I like that one. Interesting. All right. And we'll come back to the rigid molds that you guys just saw. Uh, Slimer's arm. I'll show you uh, how to brush, how work material into it, and I'll show you the uh, body mold as well for that guy that's behind me sitting relaxing. Now, besides stone molds, uh, what other ri uh, rigid molds are available? Actually, we're going right back to the epoxy molds. Um, this is what I would call a epoxy. Um, help me out, Jason. What do you call these? Uh, when you when you layer the the material, laminating. laminating. Thank you. Uh, so this is a laminated epoxy mold, so to say. Um, you have multiple products here at use. You see here on the red. This is epoxy coat red. This is a uh, detail coat. This uh, somebody will call this the print coat or even gel coat. This is where you capture all the detail, and you can see the sculpt inside that. So everything you see in here right now used to be actually, uh, there used to be a clay model, and then they applied this red epoxy right over the clay model, all right? Now on top of that epoxy, then they applied a product called Freeform Air, which is a uh, lightweight epoxy putty. You can't see it on the outside here, but you can sure see it here. So you see that light gray there? That's the epoxy putty called Freeform Air. And there's a layer go off that that's being put right against, in this case, this is the epoxy coat gray. They come in different colors. Yeah. Uh, so you're going to put a thin layer of epoxy coat gray. You put a, a layer of the Freeform Air. And then you put a layer of epoxy, epoxamite, which is a laminating epoxy and glass fibers onto the back of it. So what you're creating are super thin, but very strong and lightweight molds. And just to show you what I mean by super strong and lightweight, when you're working on large projects uh, like Slimer here, or like the silicone mask that we have here that goes actually overhead, think about it, these molds are quite large, and they have to be very lightweight for the uh, person that's casting, that's using them to handle that mold. So a mold like for the Slimer here would look something like this, and you can see how big this is compared to me, almost as big as me, but yet very lightweight, very easy to handle. Why? because it was made with epoxy, glass fiber, uh, freeform air, and then the epoxy coat gray on the inside to capture our detail. So very lightweight molds, uh, very strong, very durable, and of course, multi-part. As you can see here, this piece was made out of one, two, three, four, five, six pieces. So there's six pieces to this mold, which means there's going to be a lot of seams to be fixed on this casting once you pull it out of the mold. So we'll, we'll see some of those seam lines where that material has leaked out in between, how to fix that uh, a little bit in the, uh, later in the next section, I believe. So this would be a uh, laminated mold, uh, epoxy mold. Uh, the nice thing about these rigid molds is that you don't need a release agent in them. You can cast silicone against uh, epoxy and it will not inhibit it. It will not require a release agent. That means that the castings coming out of those molds, like this one right here, that silicone now, you got silicone movement in the back, um, this silicone has no release agent on it and is actually ready for application of paint, 
or to the actor himself. Uh, usually these masks do get painted before they are applied to the actor just to get a base color down. But this is a really good example of a squeeze mold. All right, you're gonna squeeze this part. So this is how it is. You pour your silicone into it and then you squeeze the top part into that cavity, forcing the silicone out, creating the mask itself. So you squeeze it down into it, the excess material will come out to the sides. And that's how usually prosthetics and uh, uh, simple masks that just have the front face are created. So that would be, um, that would be a rigid epoxy mold. Uh, something else that's used for rigid molds is urethane plastics. We also uh, already talked a little about, about the Smoothcast 300, which is a liquid urethane uh, product. I'm just gonna put this down here. And uh, I have shown you guys the scar plate, uh, another urethane product. Uh, here I have, this is uh, shell shock. Shell shock is also a brushable urethane plastic uh, that comes in a fast and slow. Uh, but the cool thing is it does not inhibit the cure of platinum silicones or silicones in general. So I wanted to just quickly show you guys. This is a little embarrassing because this mold is heavily broken. You can see my repairs here to try to salvage it. But I still wanted to show you for two reasons. Uh, because it's a material that not many think of for making rigid molds, for casting of silicones. And I also wanted to show you my mistakes so that you don't have to make them. So <laughs> just really quickly here, this mold broke once here. Uh, I repaired it with some epoxy and glass fiber. But then when I was making Slimer's last uh, tongue, which that's what this is, the silicone foam that I used actually swelled so much that it actually broke my mold. Now, why am I, sho why, why am I showing you this? Um, again, because I want you to uh, carry away uh, something you learned from my mistake. Uh, this mold here was way too thin. Uh, the material application was only about uh, three millimeters, so way too thin. Um, it needed to be probably twice as thick, more like uh, here on the sides. This side here looks a lot thicker, much better. So by not applying enough material to my mold and then using an expanding foam in that mold, the mold was actually uh, sprung open by the force that the foam created inside the mold. So I want to just show you guys what that looks like. Three parts, four parts. Great material, just not applied correctly by the mold maker. So uh, minus points there. Uh, this is again the mold for Slimer's tongue. Let me borrow that from you. Thank you. So here it is. This is what would actually be inside that mold. And because this is a foam material, it, it creates pressure in the mold. And if you don't have an escape route for that uh, material, it will start to expand in different areas. And then in this case, pop the mold, get out of my way, pop the mold down here not where the escape was for the material. So it worked for a couple of years. Now it needs either heavy repair or redoing, but it's a valuable material that I got, uh, wanted to show you guys that is readily used in the uh, industry to create rigid molds that don't require a release agent uh, that you can cast silicones into. All right. So uh, next thing would be to use flexible molds. Uh, you, can, uh, you have two choices in the flexible molds. You can use a silicone mold, uh, just like we have any other molds. It will be flexible, but the important part would be to actually use, here we got a silicone mold. Sorry about that. Um, you can use a silicone mold, it's flexible. Uh, but the key is you need to use a release agent in this mold. If you just pour silicone into here, it will most likely stick. Uh, so release agents are really important. Um, but we already talked about release agents a little bit uh, earlier. What I wanted to uh, show you guys is 
a urethane rubber mold that you can use for casting of silicone. Now, if you remember earlier on, we mentioned uh, that urethane rubber is a known inhibitor to silicones. So why would I use a urethane rubber to make silicone molds? It's because this is a very particular product. This one is called Compact 45. This is the casting that came out of this mold. This one is called Compact 45. It's a urethane rubber that does not inhibit uh, most silicones. Uh, there is only a few exceptions of silicones that you cannot cast into this urethane rubber, but otherwise you can use uh, most of silicones in this product. Uh, important again is to understand and read the technical bulletins that come with these materials. So let me just show you guys. So again, you you working with a new product that you haven't used before? Really important, have the technical bulletin handy. It's going to contain a lot of information that uh, you may not be aware of, and you want to read this before you start working with the product. So here, up here where my uh, fingers are, there is a short list of materials that are not friendly to this urethane rubber, so Compact 45. So I know off the bat that the sort of clear 12 and 37, the uh, near clears, will just not cure in this material. It says it right there, white on black. Uh, wait, black on white. There you go. Um, so follow the instructions that have been laid out for you. You're going to find a lot of information in these technical bulletins, and it's your first uh, reference guide to what you're doing with the materials and how to actually use these materials. So Compact 45, uh, something to mention about the 45, it's a 45 durometer on the A scale, short A scale. And what that means is that the ma material can be quite hard. So you can bend it if it's you know, long and, and thin, but when it comes to a, s a small area like this, it's actually quite dense and hard. It does not stretch very well. So keeping the durometer of the rubber in mind is really important. On a really simple mold like this, no, no problem demolding these open back mold. Now, if you have a mold like this that has a deep cavity, this is going to be much, much more difficult to demold. Uh, what are your options? Uh, make the mold walls thinner. You notice this mold is not square. I shape the mold so it actually hugs the castings that are coming out of that mold. So the model itself inside, the mold is shaped similar to the model so that my mold walls are not too thick. The thicker these mold walls become, the more difficult it's going to demold your castings out of a mold like this. Now, um, I was able to actually stick an air hose uh, in between the casting and the mold, and after applying some air, they will just pop out of the mold about halfway like this, and then I'll be able to just pull them out. So that was easy peasy, but if it uh, came down to it, I, I could have actually sliced these sideways to make the demold of our casting easier. So the, the mold material, the mold design, and the materials that you're going to be using in that mold, all together, really important to understand that color, the, the, how they work together uh, so that you have some kind of uh, expected outcome uh, from your project. The, the last thing you want to do is go into a project not understanding how it's going to pour, demold, and all that. Uh, you want to determine those things ahead of time so that you don't run into uh, difficult issues. Now, the next option uh, that you're going to see more and more is 3D printed molds. Uh, I only have a couple of castings here. Uh, the mold that we poured earlier. So this is a 3D printed mold. Again, you can see on the back that this is 3D print. It has the uh, texture to it. 
And this is also a 3D printed part. It has texture to it. So 3D prints are getting more and more common in the mold making and casting world. Uh, there's a lot of different uh, products out there that can be printed uh, that you can then make uh, castings out of. So a lot of times people are just, just go straight to printing uh, the material as a mold and not have to make the mold itself. They just print the mold. They don't need the model to make the mold off. The really important part about that is that you have to understand which 3D print filaments are going to inhibit the cure of your materials. Remember, not every uh, 3D printed filament is the same. They are a little bit different. Some of them will have uh, materials in them that will inhibit the cure of platinum silicone. And of course, we went ahead and compiled a FAQ on that topic that you can find on our website in the FAQ section on which materials will be actually um, inhibiting the cure of a platinum silicone so that you can steer clear away from those issues uh, or at least know how to handle them so that you don't uh, end in a sticky situation where the material is not curing and you end up with a mess on your hands. Something to uh, consider and think about as you're making uh, the molds themselves. I'm going to give uh, Slimer his tongue back. Um, this is made out of Soma Foma silicone and Ecoflex 0035. So both silicones, and that's why it was poured into a rigid mold that um, did not need uh, to, to have a release agent. I was just able to pour it in and then pull it out. This wasn't even painted. I just added a little bit of pigment to the uh, foam itself and was able to just pour it into it and then pull it out. Minimal seaming uh, finishing on this project. But again, made out of silicone, things you wouldn't expect to be uh, usually made out of different products. All right, I'll put this back into his mouth. All right, is there any questions, you guys? Do you have any questions about what we just saw as far as molding materials that you can use uh, for the molds themselves? We talked about a number of different products. And I just want to make sure that you guys understand what the possibilities are with the products and what is actually available to you. All right. Like I said, keep the questions coming. We're going to address them as they come in. I'm just going to pick up some of these samples that dropped as I was moving around and working. All right. So there is other options for casting of silicones. Uh, we already talked about uh, silicone molds that are flexible and you can easily maneuver. Just remember you have to use the release agents for them. Uh, another product that you can use for casting of silicone is Alginate. Uh, the one that we have here is called AlgaSafe and it's a powder. It's a algae that's ground up and it's used with water. It's a two uh, components. One component that is mixed with water and one thing you want to keep in mind that when you are making a mold with alginate, it contains water. And uh, when you're casting into a mold that contains water, you want to make sure that the molding product that you're using is not going to be negatively affected by that water content in the material. So just being aware of that and how to handle it uh, can be half of the battle. Now, if I'm handling a alginate mold that I've just freshly made, uh, one thing that I would do is turn the whole mold upside down and let the water content drain out of that mold so that when I go to cast the silicone into the mold, there is not a puddle of water that I'm actually pouring the material into. Now, the next thing I'm going to do for you guys is actually after wiping my face. Yeah, it's hot in here. You guys hot? I'm hot. I need some water. Phil, can you give me some water? What I'm going to do is I'm actually going to pour a alginate mold. Thank you, Phil. 
I got some water here, and I also got my alternate. And I also have a couple of mixing containers. Now, one important thing about alginates is the water itself. The water you want to be at about 80 degrees Fahrenheit, um, so that you have some kind of predictable working time. Uh, these materials, again, have uh, technical bulletins. I'll take that as well. I'm really thirsty today. You know what? Just give me another gallon of water. Thank you, sir. So these are two water jugs, uh, water containers. And uh, what I like to do is have a temperature reader. So I'm actually reading the temperature, and this one is 107, and this one here is 70. So controlling the temperature of the water when using the alginate would allow you to uh, stick to a working time that's predictable. At uh, 80 degrees Fahrenheit, the alginate is going to have about a, uh, a five-minute work time and an eight-minute uh, setup time. So predict predictability is important when you have uh, something like heat that will imp influence it. Uh, and you can control the speed of that setup time. So I'm actually, I have cold and warm water here, or room temp and hot. Uh, for one simple reason. I want to be able to control that time. Uh, if I want to work with something that sets up a little bit faster, I will use warmer water. And that's actually what we're going to do here. We're going to use the warmer water. I'm going to just dispense some of it. It's about a one-to-one -one mix ratio. The one thing about the alginates is that you can vary the amount of water that you're using. So the less water you're using, the thicker the material is going to be. Uh, the more water you're using, the more liquid it's going to be. Um, so you can play with that a little bit. If you haven't used the material before, make sure you do a small scale test. I'm going to actually try to mix my own temperature here. Oh, that's good. I think. So again, checking the temperature here. So that went down about four degrees, five degrees. Eh, just a little bit more cold water. I don't want it to set up too fast and I don't have enough time to actually mix the material and get my uh, hand in there. So that should be about right. Okay, I have enough material. I'm gonna put my water aside. I'm not that thirsty anymore. All right. And here I have a mechanical mixer with a drill, variable speed drill. That's what we're going to use to mix the two components together. And whenever you're mixing the components together, you want to make sure that you're mixing the powder into the liquid uh, so that you want to prevent any clumping off the material that you're uh, combining. So we can go ahead and mix this together now. I'll show you how to make a really quick mold of my wrist. All right. Now, because I am using warm water, this is starting to slowly set up. Now, we're going to put the drill in the garbage. That's not good. There we go. And what you want to do with your hand is wet it down a little bit. Just get some water on there. It makes the alginate uh, just flow around your hand a lot better. And now I'm going to submerge my hand and dip it in there. That's the material. And then you can go ahead and submerge it into the alginate. 
And we're going to go ahead and just wait for this to set up. Uh, it takes a couple of minutes. Um, so we're just going to wait for that to gelatinize and set up. But it's a very inexpensive and viable product for making props, uh, for making life casting applications. And if you guys haven't seen it, a couple of years ago we made a video on severed uh, zombie fingers using alginate and silicone. It was a quite fun project. I really liked it. And it was very easy. That's the key. Uh, it didn't take a lot of knowledge or know-how to mix the products, pour them, and then have the finished uh, castings in no time. I was actually right in time for Halloween. And you're gonna, you can touch the silicone a little bit and see if it's starting to gelatinize. It's still quite wet. Again, warmer water will make the material set up much faster, while colder water will slow it down and make it set up slower. And once it starts to gelatinize, you, you can feel it, um, but we're just going to wait a couple minutes. In the meantime, while I'm stuck in this uh, alginate here, do you guys have any questions? Because I'm really eager to answer some questions right now. When it comes time to do the casting into this one, I know there's been a lot of interest in how to um, keep the surface of the uh, alginate mold from having like water beads or a glossy surface and things mm -hmm. like that. So. so the question here was, how do you keep uh, the water in the molding product from creating a glossy surface on your casting? Uh, or, or how can you prevent that from happening, basically? And I found that uh, two things that work very well for me. Uh, number one, like I mentioned, I will take the mold. While I'm handling the silicone uh, material, I will take the mold, put it upside down so that any of the water is actually making its way out of the mold and not just sitting in that hand cavity in this case. Um, the other thing you can do, and I'll show you that as well, what I do is I add actually a little bit of talcum powder or baby powder into the mold right before I go to cast into it. And that little bit of the talcum powder will add a nice smooth finish to the uh, interior of the mold so then we, when we go to cast it, it actually comes out looking um, uh, with a matte finish versus a glossy finish. So when you see those glossy finishes, it just ends up looking a little bit too fake uh, and it just throws the end user off immediately uh, knowing that, hey, this is a fake casting, you know, it can't be real. Whereby if you do it the right way and you get a, a matte finish on the casting, you can make it look quite realistic and uh, you can make it look believable, especially if you start adding pigments and paints to the uh, casting. You can make it look like, you know, zombie or, or regular humans uh, alive. Uh, you can get quite uh, realistic with the final application just by adding that little bit of talcum powder to the casting process when you do stuff like this. Uh, Alginate, of course, is going to shrink because of the water that's in it. Right. So I'm assuming you're going to need a, a pretty fast setting silicone if you're going to cast silicone. Right. So uh, the question here is uh, the, the alginate uh, shrinks uh, while it's uh, curing, while it's losing its water. So you do need to f uh, use a fast setting silicone, and that's absolutely correct. You don't want to give uh, enough time for your casting medium and the uh, mold making medium to interact with each other. You want to just give it enough time so that it can flash off, solidify, and you can pull it out without the, the surfaces, or rather said the chemistries of each product interfere. And this is starting to slowly gelatinize. I should be able to pull out in a minute or two. So what I do is I just basically touch the surface off the alginate to see how thick it is and how gelatinous it is. Um, probably could have used a little bit of warmer water today, but I can definitely feel it solidifying because it's like thick gel around my hand. I'll give it another minute. Um, once I pull my hand out of this, we're going to do a casting into this mold. 
we're going to cast the uh, Moldstar 20T. Uh, actually, that, that goes right to that question, Jason, as far as using a fast setting silicone. Uh, Moldstar 20T, I know on top of my head, uh, first thing I know, it's a 20 durometer. Uh, so it's a bit stiffer, which is great for something like, oh, let's just go over here, like the tattoo hands. Uh, that you see here, this is a 20A durometer. So nice and stiff makes it possible for the um, tattoo artist to actually work in the material. So that's what we're going to be using. Now, what's the other thing I know about the Molstar 20T? Uh, the T in the name of the product stands for translucent. That means the material is going to be much easier to accept pigments and uh, change the color, the base color of the material. And uh, just because I use this product quite a bit, I know for a fact that it is fast setting. Uh, it has a working time of three minutes and a cure time of six minutes. So it's a fast setting a silicone that you can use for rapid prototyping. As long as you understand the materials cri criteria, you'll be able to make that work for you, not against you. All right, so check this out. The, the alternate has solidified fully now, and we're actually able to uh, pull our hand out of there. What you want to do is slowly break the tension between the alternate and your hand. So wiggle it back and forth a little bit and slowly start to wiggle outward and here we go all right there it is now if you have any stragglers inside that mold you see how that's hanging and dangling that's just going to be encapsulated in the silicone so what you want to do is you want to remove that straggler sorry that straggler hanging down there you want to remove that guy so it doesn't end up just encapsulated in the mold, in our casting. So I'm going to slowly reach in there, pull those out. Everything looks good. And remember, uh, I'm going to take my mold, put it upside down. Again, for that water content, instead of sitting in the cavity and collecting in the bottom of my cavity, now it's making its way down and out of that mold so that it doesn't uh, get a chance to pool to potentially give us uh, any kind of trouble when we're casting silicone. I can just brush the alginate off my hand. And like I said, we're using Molstar 20T for this application. Fast setting silicone, one to one mix ratios. Very easy to use. Um, just gonna get myself some Dispensing and mixing containers. That one. Put my mold aside. The water we don't need. Uh, one thing that I like to do is keep your work area clean. Uh, it minimizes any kind of incidents, issues, material spills. I'm sure we've all been there. I know I have. And since we are working with silicones, I'm going to put some gloves on. Now, one thing I wanted to bring up at this point, right before we uh, pour this, is that a lot of times you can make things, especially in our industry, in molding and casting and in general, you can make things look like something that they're not. So just by adding the right color, I'm going to dispense my part A here. So just by adding color, to the uh, material that you're using, you can dramatically change the perception of the end users of what that material is going to uh, look and feel like. So one thing I like to do is add pigment. And in this case, this is again, one-to-one -one mix ratio. I want to make sure that we have equal amounts. One-to-one -one mix ratio by volume. All right, that's good. And just like previously, I'm going to add a little bit of the uh, silicone pigment to it. We're going to use silk pig black and silk pig white. I don't need much, just a little.
And we're going to get a nice gray color out of that. Now, one thing, uh, uh, what are your, uh, when you're thinking gray and you're thinking casting uh, materials, one thing that always comes to my mind is plastics. Uh, plastics being mostly gray colors. So we want to make this casting look like a plastic object. So we added our colorants. Remember, scrape the sides, scrape the bottom. And I want to show you guys here on the side of the cup. You see that black pigment in there? This is why it's important to scrape the sides of your mixing container. You want to work that pigment into the material, not have it cling to the sides of your mixing containers. Otherwise, it will end up in your castings, and it could potentially also leach out of the casting because it's not mixed in with the rest of the product. All right, so... We're ready to combine the A and B together. Uh, remember, this is a fast setting material. So before I actually add the A and B together, I want to get my ducks in row. So take my mold, and there's a couple more stragglers there. All right. And remember, we talked about the talcum powder going into your mold. So I'm going to just add a little bit to that. Open it up. Put the whole thing upside down. Shake the axis out. Trustworthy brushes. You don't want to uh, accumulate too much of the talcum powder. You can brush it around if your cavity is open enough. Uh, you can use an uh, air hose and uh, chase some air in there. I just don't want to create a lot of noise right now with the air hose. So we're gonna just brush it around a little bit. Excess out. All right. So the mold is ready. Our material is ready to be mixed. Again, keeping that working time in mind, uh, we're going to combine the two components together. Remember, you don't have a lot of work time on this. It's three-minute work time. Personally, that gives me enough time to double mix, so I line up my cups. The B, the A is going into the B. Scrape the sides, scrape the bottom of your mixing container. Work fast, but thoroughly. Remember, scraping the sides, scraping the bottom. And because I like to, I'm gonna do a double mix. Show you that even with a fast setting material, you can do a double mix as long as you understand the products and know what you're working with. And we're ready to pour. And just like previously, we're going to pour from up high. This is a needling technique and the, most of the air bubbles are going to break in that thin stream as it's going into our mold. Now, one thing I like to do is fill up the mold about halfway. Give it a little spin around. This will allow any air bubbles that might trap in the, in the fingertips somewhere to pop, to come to the surface. And I do see a couple that did. And then uh, continue pouring the rest of the material Again, keeping the working time in mind, making sure that we don't allow the material to solidify in the cup before we get it into our mold. So there you have it, a really simple, quick uh, casting of a body part uh, that is done with alginate, uh, really easy to use material. If you are able to remove the casting out of the alginate, you're able to save the alginate. What I like to do, especially back in college, is save it, 
put it in a bag, put it in a fridge, and allow it to lose that water. And it's going to continue to shrink. So after a few days, you can do another casting, and now you have a shrunken hand. Um, quite fun uh, and interesting process to do. So we're going to move this aside, let it solidify, and then in about 10 minutes, we're going to be able to actually pull this out and show you what came off that product. Move that aside over here. Retainer cup is saved, just in case. I'll move our materials out of the way. All right, so a couple other demos we got prepped for you. We wanted to show you how to use the Compact 45, uh, the urethane rubber that you can use for casting off silicones. And for that, I have prepared this mold right here. This is a very simple block mold uh, with a textured uh, tile in here. The texture on here is actually of skin. Let's see if you guys can see that. There's, yep, there it is. So there's actually skin texture on here. And that's because this mold is going to be used for sutra pads. And we want to mimic the human skin texture uh, to give the end user a realistic application uh, of what, what the skin would look like. So we prepped our mold. We know we're pouring the Compact 45 into this. And again, looking over the technical bulletin, which is really important, um, I know that the Compact 45 calls for a release agent when pouring uh, it over urethane models. Now, most of us that use these products would automatically grab for the universal release agent because urethane uses universal release. But in this case, the Compact 45 calls for a um, Ease Release 200 mold. Sorry, Ease Release 200 release agent. So what I have done here is I already prepped the mold for us. I have already put a release agent onto the pattern, but also knowing uh, my mold box here is out of uh, gator board, which is a porous surface. So make sure that you uh, understand that. And this mold box was sealed using the um, Sonite wax paste wax. So the mold is ready. I'm going to put it here aside because we're going to be pouring into that mold uh, in a second. Uh, let's see. I have my Compact 45 materials, my A and B. And let's get a second one. All right. some dispensing containers. And some mixing containers ready. I just like to have these laid out and ready to go so once I start mixing, I don't have to stop. Um, can go ahead and dispense the product. Uh, this is a urethane material. And actually, I want to make sure I premix this because it does separate somewhat. I can tell in a color. Whenever you see on top of the uh, cap here where it says sterile, make sure you follow that instruction so that some of the material that's sitting and uh, has separated in the bottom makes it way to the top so that you have a much better final product once you, once you combine the A and B together. Just gonna add a little bit more. Premix. Don't make a mess. Again, you usually would not use urethane molding products for casting of silicone but this product has been specifically developed to allow us to do that, to use a urethane rubber mold to cast silicone into it, and we're going to make advantage of that. I'll dispense my part A. Uh, this material is very clear, so I don't need to pre-mix. Dispense all of it.
and it is a one-to-one -one mix ratio by volume. So again, I don't use gram scales, as you guys can see. I can simply dispense it equally. All right. I just wanted to take a look at the technical bulletin. I cannot keep all this information about all these products in my mind. It's just not enough space there, period. Um, so I always wanted to take a look at it. I'm not familiar with the working time of this material, so it's really important just to take a glance back and realize, okay, 25 minutes, that gives me enough time to actually mix the components together, vacuum the gas, and go get a coffee, still come back and still pour it and have enough time left over. All right. Now, one thing you guys notice here, that this product is very liquid. The viscosity is quite low. That means the product itself is going to naturally uh, degas much easier. I don't need to vacuum degas this material. Uh, again, technical bulletin quickly, because I need some more info. Uh, pa -pa -pa -pa. Hardness, 45, we got that. Modulus, elongation, shrinkage. We got all that info, okay. Mixed viscosity, that's what I was looking for. 2,600. So 2,600, that's very uh, liquid for a molding rubber. So I should be able to just mix and pour and have it naturally degas, no problem. Again, you notice that I was not too worried about the working time because I know I have extra time and I don't have to rush in mixing the two components together, but again, you want to scrape the sides, scrape the bottom of your mixing container to make sure that the two components are blended well together. And then go the other way. And because we have plenty of work time with this material, to ensure my uh, working uh, uh, to ensure the ma material is going to cure well, I'm going to double mix this product. So after mixing it in a clean container, we're going to transfer everything to a secondary container and mix it one more time. Um, some people like to even change the mixing stick that they're using. Uh, so I'm going to discard that one and just use a clean, fresh one. Scrape the sides. Scrape the bottom. And what you've done by just introducing the second mixing container, you had allowed everything that was at the bottom of the old container to now be on top, so that you get a much better chance to mix those components together. All right. Again, very easy to use material, uh, nothing special to it, no vacuuming required. But the important part is knowing that aspect about the material. If you don't know that and you just blindly order products, you're going to be sometimes negatively surprised of what you receive. So know your products. Know what you're using. Now, because this material is very liquid, we can go ahead and pour it in one single spot and allow the material to seek its own level in the mold. Again, this is called a needling technique where you pour from up high. You allow the material to pour in a thin stream, which breaks the air bubbles as they stretch in that stream. Again, minimizing the amount of air bubbles you're going to receive and see in your uh, final mold. Keeping in mind that this is a very viscous product that will easily degas on its own. Now, one uh, piece of advice here, whenever you're pouring uh, viscous materials that flow very well, 
Don't just pour a large mold and walk away and go get lunch. Take a look at the mold. Make sure that there's no leaks that have sprung. Uh, sometimes the hot melt glue did not cover everything. And you want to just get a visual uh, to make sure there is no leaks along the edges of your mold. One thing you can do, excuse me, uh, is always have some uh, oil-based clay, Sculptic Soft, very easy to handle. Have some oil-based clay. There's plenty of time where I see a, a, a mold spring a leak along the edge somewhere, and you're simply able to take some of that and put a bead off the clay right along the edge and prevent that material from simply spilling out. It's a little bit too much here, but you can also use tools. Squeeze that right in there. So something like that will easily prevent a leak that has sprung to uh, continue leaking and then waste your material. Um, I've heard and seen horror stories. I've experienced horror stories where I've created a large block mold. Everything seemed fine. I'm pouring material. I'm pouring two gallons of silicone into the mold. And as that uh, silicone is making its way into the mold, it's creating such side pressure on that, those mold walls that it slowly springs a leak uh, either somewhere along the sides or along the bottom. Next thing you know, you're panicking. You're trying to close that mold. And a lot of times you just end up with all that material just leaking out and spilling out and wasting it. So really important to not just uh, be, be very absorptive and watch what you're doing, but also stay back and then look over your work to make sure that it is uh, done right and will not uh, have a failure. Um, do talk to your mold making friends. Uh, they have quite a few uh, fun stories to tell you. Uh, the mold maker that I've learned a lot from, a uh, good friend of mine, very good teacher. I always love to hear his horror stories of mold making and what he has experienced. And he told me that one day that uh, after applying uh, material to a mold, the next mo uh, he just walked away from it, came back the next day, and all that material was just on the floor, just poured right off of the mold and onto the floor. So there was an issue, but uh, that's why it's important to watch over your material, understand what you're doing, and don't just walk away from it uh, right after you're done. All right, so we poured, your comp we poured a compact 45 mold, and uh, after that material sets up, that mold is going to look something like this. This is a cured compact 45 block mold for a, a suture pad application. You have the texture of that original tile in the mold that transferred very nicely. So when we make castings in this mold, we're going to capture that texture into our casting and be able to um, have it be visible in the final results. You see that texture? Oh, there it is. So now that we have a mold off the, uh, off the suture pad with the Compact 45, we're going to actually go ahead and cast into that mold. And for that, I'm using the uh, Ecoflex 0035. This is, again, a double zero shore scale uh, platinum silicone. It is a one-to-one -one mix ratio by volume. I don't need a gram scale. It is translucent clear. That means it will take pigment quite easily and nicely. So again, what I'm going to do is just mix up a small batch of the material. Again, dispense a one-to-one by volume. So no gram scale is necessary. It's low viscosity. I know it flows well. It will demold very well on its own. Sorry, degas on its own very well, not demold. I still have to do the demolding. And what we're doing here is we're creating the base layer of the suture pad. We're going to give this um, a skin tone color. So again, add a little bit flesh tone, a little bit of brown, a little bit of yellow. And depending on which skin tone you're trying to mimic, you're going to add different uh, silk pig pigments into that. So again, a little bit will go a long way. 
Remember, we don't want to make this look fake. We want to give it realistic look as much as possible. And once you mix the pigment into the part A here, we can go ahead and combine the two components together. Now, Ecoflex 0030 is a product that I use quite frequently. And I know it is uh, not a fast setting material, so I don't have to worry about the working time. But if you have not used the product prior, make sure that you use a, uh, the technical bulletin and understand the working off that product, the working time, the working cure, and so on. Mixing ratio. Got a couple of mixing cups and a mixing stick. Again, because this is a slower setting product, I do have enough time to double mix. And because this uh, casting is important to me, and especially this first layer is going to be the layer that uh, the end user is going to be touching. I'm going to take my time and actually double mix the components. So after mixing the A and B together in a clean container, we're going to transfer it into a secondary mixing container. And if you haven't heard me say it enough, this is a very cheap insurance policy that you have mixed the two components together very well. Now, I got a question for you guys, uh, since you guys have been paying attention so well. Um, why, why did I not use the near clear 45 to cast into that mold? If anybody wants to answer it, go right ahead. I'm waiting for the answer. But in the meantime, I'm just going to continue with my material processing. That's close. Secondary mix. Scrape the side, scrape the bottom. And once again, we're referencing back to the working times and knowing that this material is a slow setting, high viscosity, sorry, low viscosity. I know that I can actually set this aside for a minute and allow some of those air bubbles to just rise naturally out of the product on its own before I even go ahead and pour it into my mold. So actually, Alex, do me a favor and zoom in on this cup. I want to see if you can pick up the air bubbles that are bursting uh, out of the material as it's just naturally sitting there, because I can see them. I don't think we have the right light there, but you can literally see the air bubble slowly popping uh, out of the material. So the material is degassing on its own naturally. Low viscosity, longer working time makes it ideal for natural degas like this. And just like I did before, I'm going to do a, a high pour and a needle technique. So thin stream, and I'm going to let it just hit the middle of my mold and have it spread in all directions from there. Notice I did not apply any release agent into this mold because it's not necessary. And just pour it in there and peel the casting out once it's finished. Now a sutra pad like this uh, for medical uh, training uh, actually contains more than just one layer. It actually has several layers uh, in it, and um, we're going to just uh, pour one layer, and then I'm going to show you what, uh, what that would look like when it's demolded. But there's actually several layers for you guys that know the composition of human skin. Uh, there is, you know, the, you got the skin a aspect, you got the uh, meat, you got the fatty tissue, and so on and so on. Um, I'm not an expert in the medical field, but I can tell you for sure there's more than just a skin layer. And I'm just pushing some of this material. See how liquid that is? I'm pushing it into the corners so that 
I don't create a thick area in one corner and a thin area in another. I'm just going to equally just squeeze it around, push it around, and then allow this to set, sit flat so it can actually settle out. Now, a, again, a sutra pad like this will have a uh, power mesh embedded in it to closely mimic, again, the skin and uh, meat layers. So this is a power mesh that would get literally embedded into the silicone. You can just slowly set it in and it's going to soak into that because it's such a lightweight cloth. You can always give it a helping hand if something sticks up like this area here. You can just slowly push it in with a brush and let that saturate with the material. Once the material sets up uh, partially, then you're going to follow up with another layer and then with another layer of the Epox uh, Ecoflex gel for the fatty tissue. So again, I'm just going to do the cooking show style, move this aside and show you guys what a suture pad will look like coming out of a mold. So here I already poured one. It's, it has already cured. I can simply grab one corner and slowly peel it out. So there you have what we would call a sutra pad for medical training. And I want to show you guys, you see the different layers here. We have a fatty tissue layer that's actually Ecoflex gel, super soft. That's actually super, super soft and on a triple zero scale, um, whereby the outer layer is a little bit harder and mimics the skin a little bit more. And of course, you can see that the, uh, the, the rubber has, the silicone has picked up all the texture from the original model, from the mold itself. So that's what you would call a suture pad uh, for medical device training. And this is actually quite flexible and strong. All right. All right, so I promised you guys earlier that I will show you the brush-on application of Ecoflex 35 into a epoxy mold, rigid mold. This is the Slimer's arm one of the Slimer's arms that I will be brushing in the uh, Ecoflex 0035. Now, when I first uh, got this project given to me, I also sat back and thought about the materials that are available to me that I could use for this project. And I narrowed it down to a few of them. I tested a few of them and then finally um, settled on the Ecoflex 0035 for all its properties, for its work time, and for the ease of use. So I'm going to go ahead and show you guys how to set this up, how to uh, work into a silicone mold. A little bit blue, white. Always stay up on your water. An interesting point about the Ecoflex gel in that suture pad. Mm -hmm. Um, going up, you know, going into the Compat 45, normally you couldn't do gel right into the Compat. Right. But because there's a skin of the regular right. Ecoflex there, it, so, it keeps it from uh, inhibiting. So the question here that came in, um, usually you wouldn't be able to pour Ecoflex gel because it's listed on that uh, Compat 45 mold. But because we actually uh, uh, poured the Ecoflex into the mold and slushed it around, we're able to coat those mold walls so there was no Ecoflex gel actually touching the Compact 45, so we're actually able to uh, get away with that pouring into that Ecoflex mold. This is a really good uh, point. Again, understanding the materials and uh, their chemistries can lead to either success or failure, and we want to make sure that you succeed in what you're doing. All right. So here we have some Ecoflex 0035. Uh, one of my favorite brush-on silicones for this type of application for slimers. All right. And this is a one-to-one -one mix ratio by uh, volume. So we don't need to use a gram scale. It is a translucent material. All 
So pigmenting this product will be very easy. I just want to make sure we got equal amounts. Um, one thing I wanted to mention, uh, these cups that I'm using, they do have rings on them. Uh, so there's, uh, they're corrugated. They have rings on them, which makes it a lot easier when you're dispensing them uh, to, to make sure that you get equal amount of product. All right, we're going to add a little bit of the pigment in there. A little bit of green. Now, when I mixed up the pigments for Slimer, for uh, the casting of him, I took uh, several different pigments. I took pigments of the, uh, what is it called? The Ignite pigments, and premixed those thoroughly and added them. And then I added also the Silk Pig Electric pigments, which are fairly new to our addition to, to silicone pigments and I added some of those to create a custom color, a custom color that I was, uh, I felt like represented what I wanted to achieve in this project. It took me a little bit to nail down the color, so to say, to, to get it to a point where I was happy with it. And of course I did samples, samples, samples. You test your uh, pigments, you test your materials so that you know what they're all gonna look like and work together like. Okay, we're, we're kind of getting there, not enough yellow. All right, that looks better. And then I'm going to add a, just a touch of white. Again, it goes to show you how many different pigments go into creating a very specific tone. The one important thing I wanted to mention about pigments, even though we're not adding a lot of it here, it's important to understand that you shouldn't add more than 3% of pigment into the entire batch of silicone that you're mixing up. Uh, if you add too much pigment, you could, uh, uh, it could lead to material inhibition just because the material cannot set up with that much saturation of pigments in it. So I think I'm kind of getting where I want to be with the color. It's not perfect, but it will do for this test. Um, I have my colors pre-mixed. All right, I'll move these aside. Then I can combine the two products together, A and B together, and brush some material on. I got my brush, A and B. All right, keep in mind your working time. This material sets up really fast, so you don't want to delay uh, after adding the A and B together. You want to mix it thoroughly. Scrape the sides, scrape the bottom. This product has a two and a half minute work time. So you want to be fast, but thorough as well. I don't have enough time to actually double mix this material, so I'm just making sure I mix it thoroughly by scraping side, scraping the bottom, and then getting the material into my mold. And once it's in the mold, you're going to start brushing that around, just going right up to the edge. Again, work fast because the material will start to set up. And if the project is important to keep a certain thickness uh, off the project, then you don't want to end up with thick, super thick areas uh, off the silicone as, uh, as one of the samples I will show you in one minute. Um, when I started working on Slimer, there was some learning processes and the molding process. So there was a couple of failed castings that I ended up with. So we have one coating here. I'm gonna do the other arm real fast, if I have enough time. Sometimes it's really good to work in small batches with these materials. 
if they are fast setting and you don't have enough time to actually apply all of it, sometimes it's better not to apply it than getting stuck with the material solidifying in your mold where you don't want it. So I can feel this product is starting to gel and will kick off really fast and really soon. All right, there it goes. So I'm going to stop at this point. But I wanted to show you guys how I approached the making of the Slimer, where you have to uh, brush into uh, rigid molds, uh, multiple layers of a product. So right now, what I would do, if this is all coated, I already got one layer on there, I would actually close the mold, bolt these up, and then mix another batch of material pour it into the arm, and then start the rotational casting process with the material. This product is very liquid. Uh, it will easily flow in a mold uh, like this. And uh, I have to say that the first casting that you do like this, where you rotationally cast silicone, it might not turn out too good. It might be just uh, a failure. And you're going to learn a lot from the process that you can then take uh, to the next casting, to the next projects you're going to have. Uh, I do want to show you some samples of Slimer. Stay there. Especially of the arm and uh, what happens with these samples, with these uh, tests. So here's an arm that, we, that I made earlier in the process uh, when I first started making Slimers, and this was a complete fail. Uh, looks pretty good, right? Uh, the casting is all there. I'm pretty happy with the casting, but then it does this. So very, very flimsy, very mm, not acceptable, right? So what happened here? Uh, in my process of casting, rotationally casting silicone, I had to do a couple of uh, experiments as far as how much material do I need to coat this entire arm, the fingers, and make sure that it's good coated and still have the material come out. So a couple of the first tests I messed up, I added too much material, and this is actually solid rubber till about here. And that's why it's floppy. You have all this material solidified where it should be hollow, right? So that's why we end up with a casting that has a very heavy side and a very light side. So needless to say, this was a failed casting. It was, uh, you know, junk. However, I didn't just throw it out. This was a great uh, study for me for this project. I was able to study the application of the silicone, uh, brushing it into the mold, rotationally casting, adding the silicone thinner to, to thin out the silicone so it even works even better. All those things I discovered just by working the material, working the mold, and then once I had this out, um, and I was not happy with it. I was still able to use this as a study piece. I practiced my painting on it. I practiced seaming on it. So remember, you guys asked about uh, the silicone leaking out. There is a seam line here on the arm that I've actually practiced uh, seaming uh, on. So I went ahead and practiced seaming on this so that when I go to work on Slimer, I had a much better experience as far as how that's going to work out, how it's going to look, and how I can manipulate the material to my benefit. So here I'm going to turn this arm around, and here you can see some of that seam line. See that I'm pulling here? Sorry. So that's the seam line that you have to get rid of and then seam that area so it doesn't look like there was a seam there at all. So, so how, do you, how do you go about actually getting rid of that excess material and then uh, blending that seam all right. together. So how do we, the question is, how do we get rid of that seam line, that extra material? You literally go, I mean, I will address this in the next segment, but let's just chat about it a little quick. Um, the seam line itself, you would actually literally either cut away or you will pull it. I like the cutting because you have a lot more control. You see that? There's a seam line right in there. You can see it. So you can either pull it and it will rip easily because the silicone is so thin there that it will not rip the, the casting, but rip just that seam line. You could potentially pull a little bit more of a chunk off that you want to. So using scissor is always good, recommended. Um, 
But since I'm seaming all these lines where I'm removing that extra material, I'm not too worried if it doesn't look perfect. You just want to remove that extra material. Here you got it again, right there. See that? So you see all that extra material right here? So all that needs to be removed, pulled off, and that, uh, that area is going to be seamed with more material uh, and then texture is added, color and texture is added in that seam to make it blend. Now, what would you use for a seaming of that uh, line? You would use the same material that you used for the casting of the arm, because um, it will have the best uh, bond between the two if you use the same exact product. Now, the product we used for the uh, skin is quite liquid. You can't just brush it on there and then put a texture into it. So what I did is I actually thickened the Ecoflex 0035 using some um, Thyvex thickener. And uh, I was able to get a nice consistency where I can uh, work in small section, apply some material, add texture to it, let that cure up, and then work my way down. So I worked in small batches. This is very uh, tedious and uh, uh, small detailed work that takes a lot of time. But the uh, end results are really rewarding and stunning once it's finished. Uh, if you inspect the slimer behind me here, you won't see and find the seam lines on the casting because I took the time to blend them in correctly and tested the material. So here you can see there's no visibility. There was actually a seam line going down this arm here, the entire length to here. And then there is a seam around the joint where we fused it together. And all those have been blended to a perfection where the material, the texture, and the color of the application has blended so well in that you cannot see the actual seam lines on the final casting, on the final project, which is the end goal, end result for all of this. So you can see that even failed castings from uh, a project like this are very beneficial for the overall understanding, for the overall execution of that project. I also want to show you real quick, uh, for this project, I uh, started to rotocast epoxy. Uh, and here's an example of that. Let's see, So this is hollow epoxy casting. And I'm just going to take most of this off so you guys can see. So it goes all the way into the arm. Uh, it's hollow. It's very strong. Uh, and I was able to do this by simply uh, manipulating the material um, that I was using to my benefit. So I added a little bit of filler into the epoxy to make it thicker. And that gave me this white color. That's the filler color. Otherwise, the epoxy is yellow translucent. And I was able to work the material because it was fast setting, uh, epoxamide 101 fast. Um, I was able to work the material in the thickness, in the fast setting, uh, to create this hollow uh, insert or skeleton for the arm. So both arms of Slimer over there are hollow uh, resin castings on the inside, while the outer skin is a um, platinum silicone that's been painted into the mold and then rotationally casted. Now, with all that said, oh, I'm out of water. Um, let's lead into our next uh, segment here on repairs, seaming, and painting of silicone. Uh, and I just wanted to throw out at you guys again, if you have any questions, please let us know. Uh, we'll love to answer them. We'll love to hear from you and help you out in any way we can with these products. Remember that most of us here have some kind of exposure to most, uh, most of these uh, uh, materials and know how to handle them and know also what can upset them and make them not cure. So uh, let us help you with your questions and projects. Now put this arm back and actually um, let's talk about uh, the um, repairs, seaming and painting of silicone. Um, so for repairs, of silicones. There is a silicone adhesive that we use. It's called Silpoxy. I'm just going to put my materials here aside and show you guys. So here's a tube of Silpoxy. 
that is a silicone adhesive that will work on both platinums and tin-based silicones. Um, uh, something you need to know about the silpoxy is that uh, while it will stick to silicones, it will also stick to many other substrates. So you can use this adhesive to uh, bond silicone to other materials, plastics, metals, woods, all of that, uh, even uh, Slimer. I've used this to adhere many pieces like the teeth and uh, Velcro actually to Slimer so that it's, um, it's operation, uh, operationing better the way that it's uh, you know, finished with the silpoxy. I was able to utilize the material for certain aspects of that project. The, the teeth here, I uh, used the uh, silpoxy to help adhere as well as some of the product uh, uh, materials on the inside, which you guys will see in a second as well. Now, silpoxy is a one component material. There's only one tube. Um, it is air dry. So the more material you apply, uh, the slower it will cure. It will, it will cure from the outside inward. So if you have a large mass of material, the outside will cure fast uh, while the inside will cure slower. I personally like to give these materials 24 hours to a full cure before moving on uh, and putting stress onto it. Now, we did a video for reinforcing and repairing uh, tears in silicone molds. Again, you'll find that in the description uh, below uh, this video. There's a uh, brush-on mold made with Rebound 25 that I repaired using the Silpoxy and a reinforcement cloth. Reinforcement cloth, let me show you what that looks like. Here is a strip of reinforcement cloth that I've cut up. So this is a cloth that is embedded into uh, silicones and other product to give them more uh, durability. So this one does not stretch very well and not in all directions. And that's why we call it a reinforcement cloth. And we also have a product called Power Mesh, or rather use a product called Power Mesh, which is similar, smaller uh, diameter holes in it and much stretchier in all directions. So you saw me use this in a suture pad while I use the other one, the reinforcement cloth in Slimer uh, quite a bit throughout. Uh, before we move on, I want to show you real quickly here. So this is uh, one of the belly sections of Slimer that I use as a test piece to test a couple of things. I tested the uh, silicones that I was applying as far as skin making sure that it's going to be soft enough and not too hard. Um, I also used it as a sample for painting, of course. But in the back here, I want to show you a really interesting thing. So here you can see the reinforcement cloth embedded. All this is reinforcement cloth here. I was studying how the reinforcement cloth is going to help me um, keep the skin of Slimer from stretching out in the back and hold the keys that hold the skin onto a uh, rigid uh, skeleton that's inside there. So I did quite a bit of sampling and testing with these materials, with these products, additives, before finally committing to uh, application for this project. Why? Uh, this project was really important. It's taking a lot of time. And the last thing I want to do is discover that once I apply three, four, five layers of silicone, it's halfway done, that there is a cure inhibition or something is just not working in that mold. So a lot of testing went into that before actually making the piece, even to a point where I started using silicone foams just to get an idea if these products will work. So this is actually Soma Foma, silicone foam, encapsulated with a layer of the Ecoflex 35, and again, just painted to get my painting skills up to the level and make sure that this casting looks good. Now, besides the uh, Silpoxy uh, and the reinforce reinforcement cloths, I also use uh, sewing pins and the repairs that I do, and the seaming that I do. So once you combine two areas together of silicone, and you, you put silicone glue there, and you combine them, you need something to hold it in place, right? 
So what I end up using is the, uh, are these silicone sewing pins, rather. Uh, here I just want to show you what they look like. They come in different shapes and sizes. But more importantly, what I want to show you is how I manipulate them. Do you see that this one is like a fish hook, fishing hook? And that allows me to pin the silicones together, hook it in, and just allow that to cure. And then once it's done, I come out and just remove those uh, hooks, just like you would out of a fish's mouth and it's ready to go. I can move on to the next section. So these are really helpful tools that anybody working with silicones on a daily should have, especially if you're uh, seaming and uh, uh, repairing molds. Um, these are going to come in very handy throughout. And you might also see in some of my videos where I use them uh, to apply the separation channels on the mold. So very good and helpful tools that every mold maker should have in their toolbox. All right. Now let's talk about um, the seaming a little bit. So we touched up on the seaming of the uh, joints on the uh, castings, like we talked about the seams that uh, occur from the two molds coming together and leaking out along. So when you are fixing these seams, you first remove most of that flashing, just like we saw earlier. You're either going to pluck it out cut it with a knife, and then you're going to use the same material that you use for the casting. So same silicone, Ecoflex 35, was used for the seaming of this. It's just I did it in small sections at a time because the material sets up fast. I used the thickener to thicken the material so I could apply it and sculpt into it the texture that is all around. You're trying to, mix, you're trying to match the texture that is on this side of the seam as well as on this side and make that seam disappear. Uh, it's a little bit difficult at first and there is definitely a learning curve to it, but once you master it, it's just, you know, it's like brushing your teeth and riding your bike. Uh, it's just uh, tedious, uh, detailed work that requires time, but it's actually easy to do. So, um, next step, we're going to talk about painting of silicone. And one thing that I've learned uh, about painting silicone is that, first of all, you have to absolutely make sure that the uh, surface is clean, otherwise the paint will not stick. It'll be easy to just take the casting that you painted and then just rub hard on it and that paint will actually come off, Just will just peel off. Of course, uh, it's, it's terrible to see that because you invested so much time, effort, and material into that not to just see it fail. So for the painting, clean the surfaces uh, either with isopropyl alcohol. You saw us having these uh, plungers with isopropyl that we would use. We will clean the entire work area with the isopropyl and then start working on it. Now, from my experience um, in this industry, I also learned that different artists use different products. And um, the one that stuck always with me, and I've continued using, is uh, campfire fuel. So um, Coleman campfire fuel works well for the cleaning of uh, the silicone, but then also for thinning out of the silicone paint, which brings us to psycho paint. Psycho paint is actually a clear uh, carrier. It's a clear silicone that you would add pigments to, silicone pigments to this to make it a paintable medium. So it doesn't have any paint on its own, doesn't have any color, it's clear. You add the color to it and then make it as a paint uh, for your project. So uh, we're going to go ahead and mix up a small batch of this um, to apply to one of these. Now. This is a one-to-one -one mix ratio by volume. We don't need a gram scale again. Uh, the good thing uh, to keep in mind is that this material, you will be able to thin out using uh, naphtha. You can use the campfire fuel. Also, Novox 
Uh, I'm not sure if you guys heard of Novox. There's a matte and a glossy version. You can use that as well to thin out this product and paint with it. Uh, keep in mind that you can add, uh, I believe it's three to 500% of uh, solvent to the mixture uh, that you're creating. Now you wanna vary that somewhat so that um, you can either get a thicker paint application like on this snake here. So this was painted quite thick. Uh, or if you're doing washes like on Slimer here, you're gonna wanna have a lot of solvent in them so that you can apply thin washes over it and not a thick layer. However, even Slimer got some thick paint. Uh, there are some highlights on them where I uh, mixed up a thick batch of uh, yellow and just kind of put a couple of spots here and there to make it uh, more realistic, more uh, like the, the original that I saw uh, in the movies. So we can go ahead, mix up a small batch off the psycho paint. Again, this is a one-to-one -one mix ratio by volume. And just like any other of the other products, you want to be aware of the working time of these products. What is the working time? What, what's the pot life? What's the uh, cure time of them? You want to carry that in the back of your mind as you're working with these so that you don't get surprised or caught off guard and have these materials solidify on you. Now, the product uh, CyclePan does have a long working time, so I don't have to worry about that. I know that on top of my head because I use it quite frequently. Alex, did, uh, do we have any solvent here in the flammables cabinet? I actually did forget to bring my uh, campfire fuel because I wasn't camping today. But I just wanted to see, uh, have you guys see what it would look like if you thin it out. So if you're looking for a, a thick paint medium, I would not thin this out at all. You can just paint with it the way it is. But if you do airbrushing or applying thin layers of the paint, then thinning it down either with Novox or with Napta, with the campfire fuel is recommended. Thanks, Jason. Hey, look at that. Isn't that funny? You guys know who, who got this bottle, right? Anyway, so we got some uh, campfire fuel here. Look at that. <laughs> Let's see if there's anything below. Nope. All right. So we got our A and B together. We got a, 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 a color mix down that we like that we're going to apply. And then we're going to go ahead and drop that. Mix the two components together. Mix the A and B together. Now this becomes your painting medium. This is your paint. And uh, mix that thoroughly, scrape the sides, scrape the bottom. And because I'm going to be adding solvent to this, I'm actually going to transfer it into a secondary container. So that's good. You can transfer it over. Now, like I said, you can literally take this now as it is in its thickened stage and use it as a painting medium. Um, let me just quickly show you. So, uh, I have not cleaned this area at all. I can either use the isopropyl alcohol or the naphtha or the campfire fuel and literally just clean it off of any contaminants that might be present on the surface. 
What I like about the isopropyl alcohol, it actually evaporates very fast. We're going to let that dry for a minute, but you can literally then go ahead and start painting with the thickened material that you already mixed up on the silicone. Now you can see how thick that is. It's, it's leaving streaks. But in case you need it, that's the way you're going to apply a thickened area. Uh, if you need a highlight or something like that, usually I, I apply thickened material in the crevices to make uh, darker applications. And then, let's just pull this aside. I can use the same material that I already mixed up to thin it out for brush on, uh, sorry, for, yeah, you can use it for brush application, but also for, um, for, for uh, airbrush applications. Sometimes I just can't think of those words. And remember, uh, two to 500% of what you already have. So we could take this to the gram scale, or you have about a quarter inch of material here. That means I can easily add four times amount uh, four times that much in in uh, the campfire fuel without worrying of it inhibiting the material in any way. As a matter of fact, I thinned this out quite a bit and it still sets up just fine. So this is what it's going to look like when you combine the two together. You have the liquid on top and you have the thick silicone at the bottom. And you're literally going to mix this until the silicone so to say, dissolves in, in that material. So you're going to mix, keep mixing, scrape that off, mix it well back in. And now you have, well, keep mixing until everything is dissolved. You, you don't want to have thick and thin material in the same cup, so keep mixing. But what you have created now is a basically a wash. Instead of a thick paint, it's more of a wash. And let's see if we can use that same brush, scrape that thickened material off. Here's our sample. And we're simply going to start applying that paint to it. Now, it doesn't look like much when you first start applying it. It's like, well, there, there's not really any color added, but there actually is. Uh, and if you do two or three passes, you're going to notice that that's starting to darken quite a bit. So right now, this doesn't look like it has much on it, but I can actually see that there is paint on there. And based on the paint that you're using, the colors that you're using, that color variation is going to shift either fast or it's going to shift slow. And uh, the application of Slimer here, I actually, it took me about a week, seven days to fully paint the Slimer where it was finished and I was happy with the uh, application off of that, uh, off the paint itself. So there you go. Any questions on the repairs, seaming, and the painting of silicone projects? Again, please let us know in the comments. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, we'd love to hear what uh, your questions are and how we can help you with them. All right. So we're pretty much come to the end of our presentation. Uh, I want to just quickly review what we have learned today. Uh, we talked about uh, casting silicone, and more specifically, we went over why casting silicone is harder than casting resin. We also talked about applications that do require silicone rubber as an end result, as an end product. We also talked about how to choose the appropriate silicone for your project and how to narrow down the search from a wide variety of materials available. We talked about mold materials, mold making materials, forecasting of silicone and the, uh, what's available, as well as how to fix uh, mistakes, tears, seaming, and painting of your final silicone castings. The materials that we used today was the Ultrasafe to make a mold of my hand, 
We use the Echoflex 0035 for our sample, for our small scale uh, uh, test, as well as to brush into the uh, Slimer arm mold. We ended up using the Dragon Skin 10NV and the Neoclear of the Echoflex for the scar plates. And we used the Mold Star 20T to cast into uh, the mold hand, which just reminded me I do have to pull that out so you guys can see it. Well, the Sorta Clear 18 was used for our gasket. We vacuumed the gas that product. I wanted to show you a very thick material and how to vacuum the gasket. Um, we ended up using the Compact 45 for a urethane uh, pour on mold. And then we finally used the Psycho Paint and Silk Pig pigments and silpoxy to show you how to finish your products if you have a tear, repair, painting job to finish it off. So before we go, uh, I did want to uh, go ahead and just quickly demold that uh, hand that we casted into the alginate. Uh, usually I would cut this open, but since it's a very simple shape, I might be able to just pull it out. Oh, I'm going to pull the entire mold out. There we go. I'm going to chunk this away. All right. So there it is. So it has a much softer look and feel to it than uh, what you would get if you don't use that uh, 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 talcum powder and will give you much uh, more realistic uh, final casting. Uh, one thing I wanted to show you on that topic is making things that look like something, but they're not. So, you know, looking at this casting here, you would think that it's actually resin, but it's actually a soft silicone. And just using the correct or, or the, the right color to display that, uh, will throw off the end user big times. And I just want to show you guys one more casting here. Again, you see that both castings are identical. They look like they're made out of rigid plastic, but only one is. So this one is rigid, while this one is actually flexible and made out of rubber. So you can see that using the, the uh, right color can throw off the end user as far as uh, what they perceive the material or the casting is made out of. So, I want to thank you guys for watching and participating today in our presentation. And uh, don't forget that we will be announcing further events on our social media networks, in our emails, newsletters, and on our YouTube channel. So don't forget to subscribe, hit the notification bell, and uh, make sure that you follow us like a lost kitty with no molds. If you have an idea or a question, please let us know down in the comments below so that we can work with that and produce content that's more applicable for what you guys want to see. And make sure you give us a th thumbs up for this video. So with that said, I'll see you guys next time. Bye-bye.